second of viewing the, the events of today, we had the distinct honor of uh, uh, Administrator Nelson, uh, Jane Rigby, Thomas Zerbukin, uh, Greg Robinson, Nancy Lev Levison, where's Thomas? I know he's here. Yeah. There he is, Thomas. Uh, uh, to present some of the images one of, uh, last night, the President and the Vice President were so excited with the great news and what they were seeing uh, that the President actually took the opportunity to thank Jane uh, Rigby, the scientist we'll be hearing from at 1030, by calling her mother and leaving a voicemail message <laughs> about what a great deal uh, her daughter was doing to improve uh, our knowledge of the universe. And it's, that was such a touching thing. It really meant a lot to me. It meant a lot to Jane. And I think that talks about what the administration feels about NASA, that he was willing to take that time. And I know I'm about out of time. Uh, <laughs> So let me, let me get back into the program. Uh, again, pleased, pleased that uh, we have not just uh, the, uh, some of the dignitaries uh, that, that uh, Michelle mentioned. We also have Northrop Grumman, Scott Willoughby's here. Uh, so thank, thank you all for coming. We also have the Webb family in, in the audience. Uh, Jim and Barb Webb are right over here. Raise your hands. And their guest, Kaleem, uh, Kaleem, sorry, Kaleem. I've worked with Kaleem at Het NASA headquarters. You'd think I would be able to get this right. Kaleem Oluche, uh, thank you for joining us today. <laughs> well, the entire NASA, uh, James Webb Space Telescope has been two and a half decades in the make making. And as the director of this fabulous NASA Center, I'm extremely proud of all of the employees uh, as this entire project has been one of the largest collective efforts in our center's history. And I'm sure I'd like to assure you that it has been truly a collective success. We've had many engineers and scientists supporting the James Webb Space Telescope, and it is also becoming just a scientific, it's been an engineering marvel, it's about to become a scientific mar marvel. But we haven't done it alone. As Michelle mentioned, we've been doing it with partners, and it's those partners that have helped make Webb successful. Across the NASA, across the NASA community, uh, Johnson and JPL, uh, Kennedy and other centers, uh, with industry, as was previously mentioned, and I'm over time, so I'll start to shorten on that. Uh, but, I, but I will just say, uh, I'm, up, I'm up before you as a, a kind of a NASA bureaucrat, as the Goddard Center director, but at heart, I am still a NASA geek, still an engineer. It, it, a, la <laughs> a launch never gets old, and the science gets even better with each passing mission. Thank you all for coming, and let's get on to the next presenters. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. A great project like Webb takes great leadership, and today we have someone who knows what it means to be a leader. Not only was he a United States senator, he was also a payload specialist on the Space Shuttle Mission 61C in 1986. Everyone, please put your hands together for NASA Administrator Bill Nelson. I didn't know I was coming to a pep rally today. <laughs> But, but that's all the better. And you've got a, a lot to be rallying for. And you should have seen the president and the vice president last night. I mean, it, it, they were like kids. Uh, and they ask uh, just a million questions about a lot of things. And this is all because of you. It's all because of that team that is out there, that over decades, this project has come to fruition. Uh, it tells us something about NASA's unmatched ingenuity, where we make the impossible possible. And it's not going to stop, because this telescope's going to keep, like the Energizer Bunny, because of the Ariane rocket putting it on a perfect course. And so it's got fuel for 20 years now. And if that were not enough, this fall, we're going to launch the largest rocket ever, and we're going back to the moon in preparation, and we're going to Mars.
Now, this morning, folks across this planet are going to see the images captured by this telescope. And every image is a new discovery, and each will give humanity a view of the universe that we've never seen before. You're going to see the formation of stars. You're going to see devouring black holes. It's going to reveal all of this. Uh, this telescope, because of infrared, is going to be able to penetrate through the dust clouds. And it's going to see light from far away corners of this universe. Now get this, because of a NASA scientist here at Goddard who got the Nobel Prize, Dr. Mather, he determined, <laughs> he determined that the universe was 13.8 billion years. Okay, this telescope, the images you're going to see today, exceed looking back 13 billion years, and then we will look back to as far as 13 and a half billion years. Think about that. The speed of light is 186,000 miles per second, and that light has been traveling for 13 and a half billion years, only about a few hundred million years after the beginning. That's the threshold that we are crossing. And it's, uh, it's an example of what NASA can achieve. But we don't do it alone. We do it with industry. We do it internationally. In this specific case, our partners, the European Space Agency and the Canadian Space Agency. And by the way, we are now going to be determining things that we don't even know what the questions are that we ought to ask. And so it's one of these great engineering feats, not just for us, but for humanity, for planet Earth, for the citizens of planet Earth. And so there have been setbacks along the way, but because of the perseverance, here we are today. And it's these engineers and scientists and innovators that have poured their life's passion into this work, and it's now come to fruition. And it's progress like this that drives us forward, and it gives us inspiration. Our rockets run on fuel, but inspiration is the fuel that drives NASA, and indeed <laughs> drives humanity. So this novel innovation that made Webb possible is exactly why NASA and why humanity continues to push the envelope, as the test pilots say. Push the edge of the envelope. NASA's no stranger to first steps, and as we enter this new era of spaceflight and discovery, we need to be bold. We have to take risk, but the reward is worth the risk, and this is proof of that. It represents the largest international space science program. It collaborates internationally. Now, Michelle, I'm going to turn it back over to you uh, to share messages from our international partners. Thank you so much, Minister. The mission would not be as successful as it is today without the teamwork and contributions from our mission partners, the European Space Agency and the Canadian Space Agency. We are pleased to share with you a special video message from ESA's Director General, Dr. Joseph Oshbacher, and their Director of Science, Gunta Hazinga.
The James Webb Space Telescope is such a fantastic opportunity. It's a once in a lifetime opportunity which we have here and uh, we are so excited, uh, both Günther and myself, uh, on this first data release. Uh, it will really change the understanding of our universe. But uh, before I hand over to Günther, just one word. This is also a symbol of uh, international cooperation. The partnership we have with, with NASA is uh, outstanding. It's, uh, it's really uh, exciting but really fantastic and also with uh, CSA, the Canadian Space Agency. And uh, this is more than science, it's also a symbol of international partnership. But Günther, a bit more about the James Webb Space Telescope, what this means. Thank you very much, Josef. Yeah, this is the day that we have all been waiting for for so long and now, now it's happening. Uh, you know, James Webb is a fantastic machine and its um, infrared eyes are three times sharper than the Hubble Space Telescope and they are 100 times more sensitive. So with these infrared eyes, you can peer into dark, obscured regions in our universe. You can look at the very first phases of the universe after the Big Bang. You can look at planets in our own solar system and in around other stars. And it is indeed a once-in-a-lifetime chance, almost like the, the moon landing for astronomy. And it will actually feed many, many careers. It has already shaped a whole new generation of scientists and this will continue. It's a masterpiece for international cooperation, as Josef had said. Um, uh, we are working with NASA and the Canadian Space Agency, and this is actually in tradition to Hubble, to Cassini-Huygens, uh, where NASA is leading and ESA is partnering. But we are also opposite uh, having missions where ESA is leading and NASA is partnering, uh, like for instance, um, Beppe Colombo Juice, uh, the Euclid spacecraft, and so on. So ESA, the science program, is actually enabling the European scientists to lead in a number of discrete fields and one of the important fields is, for instance, astrometry with Gaia, where we are uh, really having a leadership position. And now James Webb. James Webb will answer a lot of questions, even some questions which we do not even know about yet. Talking of uh, NASA and uh, what we do here, I mean, of course, we have many contributions in the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, we have uh, instruments, one and a half instruments uh, that we are providing. We have a science team that is working with NASA and the other partners. But one event was uh, very special, and which was the launch of uh, the James Webb on Christmas Day uh, from Kourou on Ariane 5. And uh, this was uh, really a very important event for us. Uh, not only is NASA entrusting this uh, James Webb Space Telescope to us, uh, or Visa, but also the insertion of the uh, James Webb Space Telescope into orbit was so precise that uh, scientists have a much longer lifetime of the James Webb Space Telescope, actually doubled the lifetime. And this is really fantastic because this really shows also that our space transportation technology, in addition to the science uh, technology, is just uh, outstanding and very proud and very happy about that. So go Web Go! Go Web Go! <laughs>
If it wasn't for years of steadfast congressional support, this extraordinary project wouldn't have been able to get off the ground. So it's fitting that we have representatives from Team Merlin joining us. And let me clarify, these gentlemen are not just representatives. They are friends of NASA Goddard. Please join me in welcoming Maryland's 5th Congressional District, Majority Leader of the United States House of Representatives, Steny Hoyer, Senator Ben Cardin, Senator Chris Van Hollen, and the Representative Trone from Maryland's, David Trone from Maryland's 6th Congressional District. Thank you very much, Michelle. It's good to be here with astronaut Nelson. So sorry you're sick, Andrew. <laughs> All of us have fought. Hubble was at risk. Goddard was at risk. Webb was at risk. This day, this day gives a new meaning to as far as the eye can see. The vision of the world is greater today than it was yesterday. And it will redound to the benefit of all the peoples of this earth. What a wonderful day. I want all of you who have worked on this project to stand up. Stand up. All right, you're, you're using our time. <laughs> America thanks you, and the world community thanks you. Our time is short. Let me yield to the senior senator from, the, from Maryland, my dear friend Ben Cardin, who has fought so hard, along with Barbara Mikulski, to make this day happen. Thank you, Stanny. First, I Excited. This event is the hell of this world. <laughs> How many times have I said that? I can really mean it this time. <laughs> we are so proud of the role that Maryland has played. You heard Michelle mention all the different organizations and government agencies and institutions and private. So many of them are located in Maryland. Stunny already acknowledged the incredible workforce. We know the 20th century will be known for space exploration by Neil Armstrong steps on the moon. The 21st century the work done by the James Webb Telescope. This is an incredible moment. It's now back to the future, and we're going to be part of it. Chris Van Hollen. Well, it's great to be back here at Goddard, and thank all of you who have been part of this team. You know you've made it when you have your own cheerleading squad. Um, <laughs> As somebody who was uh, briefly a physics major but bailed out after quantum mechanics, I want to thank all the scientists and the engineers and everybody who stuck with it to bring us to this brilliant day. This is a great day for humanity, peering further back into time, deeper into our universe, answering some questions that are fundamental to who we are and how we got here. Thank all of you from around the world because this was an international endeavor. And while there were bumps along the way, once the launch happened, everything had to go perfectly. And it did because of all of you. I do want to say Maryland is proud, at least on this day, to be the center of the universe. And uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you to Goddard. Thank you to the Space Telescope. And we're going to continue to invest in this mission and so many others, along with my friend, David Trone, who's also on the Appropriations Committee in the House of Representatives. So thank you all very much for this incredible moment in scientific history and space exploration is what connects us all. And that's what's so fantastic about it. As the saying goes, if you want to go fast, Three, go four, alone. Five. But if you want to go far, go together. And this team has gone together. So thank you and congrats.
This telescope is by far the largest science endeavor NASA has ever undertaken, and it required a huge network of companies from around the world to build it. Northrop Grumman led that team and helped NASA and its European and Canadian partners to achieve the success we see today. To help celebrate that success, we have a special message from Northrop, CEO, Northrop Grumman CEO, Kathy Warden. On behalf of the entire Northrop Grumman team, congratulations to the space and science communities around the world on what will be the first of many exciting and truly historic web missions to come. These incredible images never before seen by humankind carry us further than we've ever gone before, and we're just getting started. The extraordinary telescope represents a new era in human discovery and equally important, it represents the engineers, technicians, scientists, and the countless other teams that have come together to define possible. Our work, the technology we've created, and the images it captures will inspire the next generation of thinkers, innovators, and problem solvers. This is the true legacy of Webb. Thank you and congratulations. As I said before, it took companies from around the world to get Webb in space. Right now, we're going to hear from the CEO of Ariane Space, Stefan Israel, with a message he would like to share with you. Webb, an incredible adventure we at Ariane Space were honored to be part of. A 20 years collective challenge that finally brought us together in Kourou with Dr. Z. Greg Robinson, Joseph Ashbacher, Daniel Lunchfender, and Philippe Baptiste on a Christmas morning we'll never forget. 27 minutes and 11 seconds, which will be among the most important of our lives. After a perfect launch with our Ariane 5, which has doubled the web lifespan and such a long journey, we are now on the verge of discovering images that will revolutionize our understanding of the universe. A game changer created by the collective work of passionate and brilliant people from USA, Europe, and Canada. To these dedicated teams, I want to say thank you. Thank you for your trust in IAN that made this incredible adventure possible. Go web. All right, guys. We're only a few minutes away from seeing the first images, but before that, I would be remiss if we didn't take an opportunity to let those that led the way have an opportunity to say a few things. We have the web program director, Greg Robinson, North of Bremen's web program manager, Scott Willoughby, and last but certainly not least, the web project manager, Bill Oaks. <laughs> I'll just wing it. Uh, so I will say when I came up the stairs, when, by the time I got to the top, I wanted to throw off the jacket and run out to the 50-yard line. <laughs> so, so thank you for that welcome. I don't know what I would have done when I got there. Uh, so, so who did not see that image yesterday? Well, as the old saying goes, you ain't seen nothing yet. Just hang around a little bit longer. I just want to do a, a couple of quick thanks, thank yous. Uh, you've heard from most of them, uh, thanks to the entire team, certainly the Goddard-led project team, Northrop uh, Space Telescope Science Institute, and our international partners. Also, I, I want to thank, uh, I, I call it the ninth floor, the, the uh, NASA administrator and his team, and the White House and, and Congress. Uh, all of us are part of this, and when I say team, I mean everyone from beginning to end, and we all had to be aligned to make this happen, as Thomas often reminds me. So thank, thanks for all of that. I want to do a couple of special thanks. Uh, special thanks to Scott Willoughby for leading the team out at Northrop, Bill Oaks for leading the overall team, and I know both of them will say more about their teams and the capability of, of the uh, spacecraft. And a special thank you to Thomas. I often say twisting both of my arms to get me to take over this, to be part of this incredibly smart and resilient team. So thank you and thanks for coming. It's humbling to be here at Goddard 
um, my team from Northrop Grumman spent a lot of team here and at many of the NASA centers and other places around this country. But this is where relationships were forged and it's relationships that built the James Webb Space Telescope. And it's been a common theme here for a purpose, right? The international relationships, the government, the government industry relationships, but the relationships that are dearest to me are the ones that took place on the floors of the high bays and in the meeting rooms and debating hard problems. And sometimes those answers weren't certain as much as engineering wants to be. And you're using judgment and people's guts and brilliance to make decisions that led to perfection. And what Bill and I did throughout all of this was really kind of singular. It was giving that team power. And I just kind of leave with a phrase that I used back when we were getting into the final build a web, when people were putting this together, that every human who touched this for the last time should know you get that privilege and you get to bring your pride to the floor to do that. But you have to check your ego because pride is powerful but somebody's gonna ask you a question, did you do it right? And somebody's gonna look at a picture when you did it and see was it right? And somebody else was gonna review that and stamp that it was right. And every single person mattered in that. And in the end, it was perfect. So thank you. And working with Bill was really a relationship that's gonna last a lifetime, over a decade. I think we broke the record for industry government partnership. We're not supposed to be together for 10 years, but we were, Bill. Thank you. Well, I guess I'm, I'm the cleanup, typical job for a project manager. Um, first, just a little update on the observatory. Um, over the weekend, we finished the last commissioning activity, so we are officially done with commissioning. We have, we have an observatory that is in excellent shape that either meets or exceeds requirements. And as mentioned earlier, we have 20 plus years of fuel on board. And finally, we have actually started our first year of normal science operations, and that is now in full swing. So, as the old saying goes, it takes a village. Well, with the web, it actually took a town of about 20,000 people over a period of 20 plus years across 29 US states and 14 countries. And even more, if you add to that number, the, the family, the friends, the significant others, et cetera, who supported Webb, they are also part of that Webb team. You cannot really single out any one person for the success of Webb, but everyone here should know that every you see each image, you are a part of that image. We would not be successful without your con contributions to, to the Webb program. When I see these images, I see four things. I see dedication, and I have never seen dedication on this project like I have seen on any other mission I have worked. I see personal sacrifice of so many individuals that my heart is just overwhelmed with pride for the folks on this program. Finally, also I see passion. I've never seen the passion for this program. That's what helps with the first two things I mentioned. Finally, I just see the faces of all our individuals who have worked on this program, both the past and the present, and I can, by neither myself nor NASA will we ever be able to think, thank these persons enough. And finally, on a more personal note, the Webb team itself, we are all going to be bonded for the rest of our lives by the Webb experience. And I have to thank you for the privilege that you have allowed me to be part of that experience. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, thanks. Thank you. All right, thank you and congratulations, gentlemen, and congratulations to all of you once again. Today, we celebrate you and your achievements. Now listen, I'm sure you're excited to see exactly what Webb will show us, so here's the plan. We're going to take a quick break, but as you, but as you all at home can see the countdown clock, we're literally minutes away from the reveal. Are you all still excited? <laughs> It has been my absolute pleasure spending this time with you. We can't wait to share what humankind is capable of, and we are just getting started. Let's enjoy this journey. Now, on the count of three, I want you all to scream, go web. One, two, three. Go, go web! <laughs>
sky watchers, this is it. This is the day we get the first science images back from the James Webb Space Telescope. And you've got a front row seat to the cosmos. I'm Michelle Thaller, your host for what can only be described as a celebration for everyone on Earth. So think about this. Light from the earliest days of the universe has been traveling to us for billions of years. Just over the last few weeks, we've captured some of that light with a telescope that sees the universe in an entirely new way. And today we share the very first results. So longtime space fans are gonna know who this is. This is Dr. John Mather. He's the senior project scientist for the Webb Telescope and a Nobel Prize winner. And John, I couldn't be happier to be here with you today. Thank you, it's a thrill to be here for this very special day. How are you feeling? I am thrilled and I'm relieved because you know when you start something this big, you know there's always a possibility. It might not work, <laughs> it did work. We are so proud. And you've been on this project for a very long time, right? Yeah, I started in 1995. We had just finished measuring the Big Bang. We measured it with a cosmic background explorer satellite that we built right here at Goddard. And we measured the spectrum. We measured there are hot and cold spots in the Big Bang. So we said, now we know it all, how it all got started. But then what happened after that? So then I got a call from NASA headquarters. Would I like to work on this new telescope that's going to help answer those questions? What happened after the Big Bang? How did the galaxies grow? How did the first black holes grow? what happened all the way from there to here. So this is our time machine and I just wanted to be part of it. I am so thrilled that we got a chance to do it. You know, one of the things that I remember you saying, and this is kind of amazing, that you know, after you win the Nobel Prize, you thought that this mission was the most important thing to work on. Absolutely, it's the next question. After you know how it started, what happened then? And you know, when suddenly we now have the technology to do it. We didn't have 50 years ago didn't have the technology 25 years ago even when we started this. We had to invent things along the way, so we did that, and here it is. Well, thank you, we'll be back to you in just a moment. So at the moment, we're gonna talk about the way that Webb is a completely new way to explore the universe. So today, the mission releases its first science images and gives wings to the dreams of so many people who worked so hard for so long to make this possible. For everyone on Earth, this is your telescope. This is the largest, most powerful observatory ever put into space. It's the product of thousands of people working for more than two decades. This is a mission that's singularly focused on the biggest questions in science. So the following phrase is often used too easily, but today actually does mark the dawn of a new era. Today, the Webb mission is open for scientific business, and this is just the beginning. The best is yet to come. So John, one of the things you told me about is that you really want to make sure there are some people that get thanked, people that put a huge amount of effort into this. Absolutely. Uh, our current project manager, Bill Oakes, uh, took the project from a time of trouble when we were, didn't exactly know how we were going to get this to work and got it all the way to the end. Here it is, it is working and it's because of Bill made this worldwide team, 20,000 people around the world were involved in making this thing all work and Bill has been there every day making sure that it would happen. So another uh, special person is Senator Barbara Mikulski. She saved our telescope and she saved the telescope before us. She made sure after the Hubble telescope was launched and it was not in focus, that we would go up and fix it. She made sure that happened. When the Webb telescope needed more resources, she made sure we could get that. So Barbara, we thank you. <laughs> well, it is such an honor to be with you, Jay. I mean, it's been a pleasure to be working with you through this whole thing. Thank you so much. Congratulations and go Webb. Thank you. <laughs> So this broadcast, much like every part of this mission, is a partnership. On our journey to explore distant places in space, we've been joined by intrepid travelers from around the globe. We have so many extraordinary collaborators. So let's check in with our partners who will be sharing the stage with us today as we reveal Webb's five first science images. From the European Space Agency, I'm joined by Katie Haswell in Darmstadt, Germany. Katie. I see Katie in the background there. <laughs> also joining us from the Canadian Space Agency in Montreal, we have Natalie Ouellette and Sarah Gallagher. Bonjour. I see Katie in the background there. <laughs> see the waving too. <laughs> and so naturally, we're also going to be visiting the nerve center of this mission, the Space Telescope Science Institute, on the campus of Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, Maryland. And there we have Alex Lockwood and Carl Gordon, and they're going to give us updates and more. Good morning. 
Right. Great. So we'll be back with our international partners shortly, where they'll each reveal one of the new images. But today we're also going to be joined by millions of science fans from around the world. Many are gathered at watch parties just for this event. So here we are really going international. So I'm beginning with Bhopal, India. Do we have a signal from Bhopal? Yes. Excellent. Welcome to NASA. Hello, everybody there. Yes. Wonderful to be where talking to you today all the way in India. We'll be back to them we'll later, back. yes. Great to wave to you. Hi, wonderful. <laughs> and we're also, we also have a warm welcome now in Portland, Oregon. So we have the feed from Portland. A bit dark, but I see everybody there. Hello, Portland. They're at an auditorium, I see. Okay, okay the next we're going to go off to Milan, Italy. So afternoon in Italy, do we have the feed from Italy? I guess we have a screen from Italy. And uh, next we're going to go to Rutland, Vermont. So is this Vermont? Hello, Vermont. Hi, everybody. <laughs> nice to see you. Thank you for being part of this today. Okay, going even a little bit further afield, we have Netanya Israel. Hello. Hello, Israel. Yay. Hey. Really nice to see you guys. Okay, just one more for now. Uh, I, I see people like giving me hugs. <laughs> okay, we also have Vancouver, Canada. Hey, Vancouver. Hi. All right. Wonderful. Wonderful to have all these people with you. So right across from the campus from me, there's also a huge watch party taking place with members of the web team. So the wonderful thing is that they actually are people that have worked on the mission and they are part of our NASA funny family. <laughs> so hello, hello web team. There they are, yes. <laughs> a lot of people I recognize there. So it's incredibly important to me personally, and also to all of us at NASA, that the universe belongs to everyone. And we are thrilled to share this day with fans everywhere around the world. We'll say hello to some more later in our broadcast. So now it's time to start the main event. What you'll see over the next hour will be a collection of images newly processed by the web science team. Only a tiny handful of experts have seen the images so far. And I can tell you that we have been so excited to unwrap them for everyone. We will be releasing each image in turn in real time. As soon as you see it on this broadcast, it will be available for download on the internet. On the screen below, you can see a timeline showing where we are in the show and what's coming up next. And by the end of the show, all five images will be available to everyone. So hopefully you can tell I'm excited. Okay, so let's do this. Okay, we're going to release the first image right here at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, Maryland, and we're just outside of Washington, D.C. NASA Goddard is home to the project office of the Webb Telescope, and the observatory po portion of the telescope, the, the mirrors and the science instruments, were integrated and tested here before launch. So for many of us, including myself, seeing Webb come together bit by bit right in front of our eyes was an emotional and very inspiring experience. So it's kind of like a part of us was out there with Webb right now. A million miles away, part of our hopes and dreams are out there. So I'm joined now by Jane Rigby, the operations project scientist for the Webb mission. And she's a familiar face for people who've been following this before. So welcome, Jane. Hi, Michelle. OK, so Jane, you not only get the honor of revealing the first image, but th this actually got a little bit of a sneak preview. I understand yes. there was a very select audience who's already seen the image. Yes, so last night, uh, on behalf of the project, I had the privilege of traveling to the White House uh, with, the Nelson, with the NASA Administrator Nelson and other senior sh staff to share our first image with President Biden and Vice President Harris. And it, it was really fun, oh my gosh. Um, we're, uh, they really geeked out. We had a closed door session where we got to walk through all the images and just share the excitement. And they were so thrilled and they got the profundity of what we're seeing. And so now we're gonna, we're gonna, let's do it. Okay, we've got the whole world watching. Are you ready to put the first image up? Oh, let's do it, let's do it. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, here we go. Ah, <laughs> okay. So the first image is a deep field and it's also a deep field with a cluster. So why don't we walk through this just a little bit? So if we come up and look at this image, first of all, it's really gorgeous yeah. and it's teeming with galaxies. And that's something that has been true for every image we've gotten with Webb. We can't take blank sky. Everywhere we look, there's galaxies everywhere. And so you know, this, gal this, this image, as we're looking at it, what we're seeing is not just all the galaxies, but there's a cluster here. And so the cluster are all these white kind of ethereal galaxies. We're seeing them as they looked back in time. 
right? The speed of light is only so fast. And so as we're seeing distant galaxies out in space, we're seeing them as they looked billions of years ago. So these cluster galaxies, the white ones, we're seeing as they looked about the time the sun and the earth formed. And then behind the cluster, we have uh, the cluster, the, the the gravity of the cluster is distorting and warping our view of what's behind. And so there are these galaxies that look stretched and pulled, kind of like, like they've been magnified because they've been magnified by the gravity of the cluster, just like Einstein said they would. And you know, it's really, there's so much detail here. We're seeing these galaxies in a way that we've never been able to see before. There's just a sharpness and a clarity we've never had. And so we can look at, if we zoom in on this image, and I encourage you as you grab this image at home, like zoom in, it, you can you know, really zoom in and play around. There are galaxies here in which you're seeing individual clusters of stars forming, popping up just like popcorn. Um, and then we also see in the background of this, of this image kind of littered like jewels all over the back of the image are these faint red galaxies. Now, that was what we built the telescope to do. The most distant of those are billions of years. We're seeing as they looked more than 13 billion years ago. And so galaxies like that one right there, this little red guy, you're like, OK, yep, what is that? Well, Webb got spectra to figure out what those galaxies are made of. And this is that one. We're seeing as it looked 13.1 billion years in the past less than a billion years after the Big Bang. And we're seeing the elements of oxygen and hydrogen as well as neon. You know, this is, the kind, this is how the oxygen in our bodies was made in stars, in galaxies. And we're seeing that process get started. Yeah, I just, I want to give this a little bit of context. So this is now the farthest away galaxy that we have this sort of detailed information about. That we know what it's made of. We know like what it's that. made of. Yes. And this was not a long exposure for Webb. No. The, 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 pre the previous record holder, right, the Hubble uh, Extreme Deep Field, mm -hmm. was two weeks of continuous work with Hubble, and it was just imaging. With Webb, we took that image before breakfast. The amazing thing about Webb is the speed at which we can churn out discoveries. So everything that you're going to see here in this broadcast is a week, and we're going to be doing discoveries like this every week. That is absolutely incredible, Jane. So thank you so much for joining us. It's been an honor to be working with you. Congratulations on all your hard work. <laughs> thank you. It's so wonderful to see it pay off. <laughs> so thank you. And I'll see you later on today, I hope. So yes. enjoy the day. Thank you. Right. So from distant galaxies, we now turn our eye to something a bit closer. It's a planet, but not one in our solar system. Remember that Earth and its sibling planets aren't the only show in the universe. When scientists and engineers started developing JWST, the search for exoplanets wasn't even part of the plan. That's changed. Exploring exoplanets is now a major component of the mission and the subject of our second big reveal of the day. I'm going to send it now to our friends Natalie Ouellette and Sarah Gallagher at the Canadian Space Agency in Montreal. So again, bonjour. I guess we're, we're, we're having a little... Sorry for the brief uh, pause there. We're now going over to Canada. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yep, we're all ready. Yeah. Okay, I apologize. We're having some trouble with the signal from Canada. But luckily for us, we have an exoplanet expert right here, just in case that happened. So this is Nicole Colon, and she's uh, an exoplanet scientist at NASA. And we're going to talk about this amazing new result from a very hot planet, I understand, about a thousand light years away. That's right. The exoplanet is named WASP-96b, and it is this hot, gaseous, giant, puffy planet that it is about a thousand light years away. So that's why today is really so exciting, that's because right. it teases out what Webb is going to do for such a distance. Absolutely. So talk us through what this discovery is and, and why this is so significant. Mm -hmm. Well, this uh, reveal that you're going to see is going to show the first spectrum of an exoplanet as taken from the Webb telescope. And this is exciting because it covers infrared wavelengths of light that we have not had access to 
before. So we've been able to use other telescopes to explore exoplanet atmospheres in the infrared, but not to this level of detail. And this is just one sliver of data that Webb is providing us using the nearest instrument specifically. And there's something about um, infrared that is actually particularly good for, for the spectrum. So in this, in this case, what we're doing is we're actually going to take the light and break it up into a rainbow and look very, very carefully at how much color is coming in, in, each, in, in each part of the, the spectrum. So I believe we have that image, if we can put that up. Okay, yes, I, I believe we're revealing the spectrum right here. <laughs> so we now have our spectrum, and this is exactly what you're seeing. As you just described with spectroscopy, what we did was we observed a transit of an exoplanet. We observed the planet as it passed in front of the star. Now, mind you, this is not a direct image. This is an indirect image. So we've seen the effect of what happens when the planet and its atmosphere passes in front of the star. The starlight filters through the atmosphere. And then you can break that down into wavelengths of light. And you get a bunch of what looks like bumps and wiggles to some people, but it's actually full of information content. So you're actually seeing bumps and wiggles that indicate the presence of water vapor in the atmosphere of this exoplanet. So we have the spectrum up here. Is there anything mm -hmm. you'd like to, to highlight particularly? Yeah, absolutely. So we have um, several features marked here. So I call them features. They are these, what I just referred to as bumps and wiggles. But what you're seeing here is a telltale <laughs> signature, the chemical fingerprint of water vapor in these atmospheres, in the, in the atmosphere of this specific exoplanet. And the other thing we can tell actually is that there's evidence of clouds and hazes because the water features are not quite as large as we predicted. So we can take that and infer that there are presence of clouds and hazes. Right. Now, one thing that we really want to make sure people understand is with this particular planet, this is a hot world. It's actually closer to its star than Mercury is to our sun. Mm -hmm. And so we're not looking at liquid water here. But we're, we're looking mm -hmm. instead of, at, at sort of steam, water vapor. Yes, this is a, an exoplanet. It's a, about the size of Jupiter, about half the mass of Jupiter. It orbits around a sun-like star, but it does it every about three and a half days. So it's extremely hot, extremely close in, nothing like our solar system planets, but that's okay because what we're seeing is, again, the first exoplanet data from Webb, and this is just the beginning. We're going to start pushing down to further smaller planets and being able to take measurements just like this with the NEARS instrument that um, was built by the Canadian Space Agency, but also there's other three, three other science instruments that will add to our knowledge in the infrared as well as direct imaging modes along with the transit method. So there's a lot more to come. And I guess one thing we should mention is not only are we going to be looking at planets that are more like the Earth in the future, but we'll also be looking at planets in our own solar system. Absolutely, yes. We're going to have um, exciting data from planets in our solar system from Mars uh, outward as well as asteroids and comets. So stay tuned for a lot more to come. Thank you so much, Nicole. Thank you so much for telling us about the spectrum and I'll, I'll be seeing you later on today. <laughs> So we have three more big image reveals, and with that, new and more exciting science. But first, let's take a look back at the journey that brought us to this moment. Celebrations like this one are only possible with years of hard work from a cast of thousands. When a new mission is being built, even the most enthusiastic space fans only get to see dramatic moments in this life cycle, the news and images that come out in updates and press releases. But that doesn't really give you the sense of the huge effort that goes on behind the scenes every day. The plan, schedules, and organization to keep everything moving forward really happens, for the most part, out of people's gaze. Webb started as an idea that took root at NASA Goddard. It grew at first into planning teams, research projects, schematics, requirements. Then it began the long journey to become real with the development of new technologies, cutting edge engineering, and finally fabrication, putting it all together. Let's take a brief look back at the visionary journey to how we all got here today. So today was the final closeout of the purge. Okay, guys, I can hear Rupa, so it's but, but... a pretty emotional moment to be in there and actually, you know, closing it up for the very last time, right? You know you're the last one to touch this. And so that was the final operation. And once that fitting is closed out, um, there's no more touching of the vehicle. We're ready for launch. The James Webb Space Telescope, born from the desires of astronomers, achieved with newly invented technology, is the culmination of 20 years of work.
Humanity has unlimited questions about our universe. Engineering a way to investigate them requires enormous creativity. Webb has been a trade-off between engineering performance, the, what the astronomers want, risk. In fact, when we started 20 years ago, we were actually looking at an eight meter telescope. Developing the most sensitive instruments and testing and more testing. And so you don't want to build one that's just incrementally better than what you've got. Because if that's the case, you would just observe longer on the telescope that you already got. And so every time NASA builds a new astrophysics mission, a new telescope, it needs to be way more sensitive, you know, way more capable than anything we've ever built before. We all got together in that conference room and we played real time as the images came down uh, from the spacecraft, uh, the very first diffraction limited images ever obtained with Webb. And what we collectively saw as a group was the highest resolution infrared image taken from space ever. If you're just joining us, I'm Michelle Fowler at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center, and you are watching live coverage of the release of the first science images from the James Webb Space Telescope. So it's appropriate now that I send the broadcast to our colleagues and friends at the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore. That's the scientific nerd center of the entire Webb mission. So hello, good morning, Alex. The show is yours. Hey, Michelle. Welcome to the Space Telescope Science Institute. I'm Alex Lockwood, and I'm here with Carl Gordon, who is an astronomer and one of the key people in delivering the images that you're going to see here today. But actually, before we get into the amazing images, we're going to talk a little bit about where we are. We're standing here outside of the Mission Operations Center, which is the key central hub for Webb. For the past six months, scientists and engineers have been working 24-7 since they took control of the telescope 30 minutes after launch to prepare for today and for the amazing science to come. Through all of the major deployments, focusing, aligning the telescope, and calibrating those four amazing science instruments, it was all done in this building. And from here on out, we'll have daily communications with the telescope, including sending commands and downloading data with the help of the Deep Space Network. In addition to mission operations, we are also the home of science operations. Well, what does that mean? Every year, we solicit proposals from astronomers across the country for, and the world, for what they would like to look at with Webb. Then we hold a rigorous selection process to select the ideas that will best utilize Webb to study and understand our universe. When the data come down and astronomers analyze their results, we are the lucky ones who get to share that data and those amazing science results with you. And we knew that today was gonna to be so exciting with the first images, so we've actually been preparing for years here is Klaus Pentapaden, project scientist for Webb and the technical lead for the first images, yeah, it's been a year to tell you process. about the process of the past few years of selecting the targets. I my first email targets. related to the, uh, the first images was back from 2016. Uh, so back then, uh, a committee was created, and this committee was charged with coming up with a long list of targets for the first images. And the reason for that is that the observatory can't see the entire sky at any given time. And this is because you want to avoid the mirror seeing direct sunlight to keep it cold. And it actually had to be quite a long list. We ended up with about 70 targets from which we had to select only a handful. You know, what would create the most beautiful images, what would highlight the instruments, the four different four science instruments for Webb, and what would highlight the four uh, major science themes for Webb. And it's a celebration as well of the beginning of science observations. And we knew that selecting the images was just the beginning, that we would need a trained eye to take these exquisite data and pull out the beauty and the science potential. So here's Jody Pasquale and Elisa Pagan to tell you about how they processed these beautiful images. And 
we're basically translating light that we can't see into light that we can see by applying uh, color like red, green, and blue to the different filters that we have from web. And the reason we want to color the images is because there's actually more that you can get, more information that you can get from the image if you see it in color. So it's a matter of picking and choosing filters and colors that enhance the details and the structure in the image itself. The shortest wavelengths of infrared light and assign those blue colors and then move our way down to green and red as we go to longer and longer wavelengths. And then we additively combine those together to get our full color image. But there is a lot of aesthetics that are involved in this. And painstakingly going through and cleaning these images up uh, with a, an attention to detail, a level of detail like at the pixel level in every image. So when I'm working on the astronomical data, it is this sort of marriage between art and science. When you're choosing colors for the filters, you really are trying to show the different details and the processes that are happening in astronomical images. But at the end of the day, you want it to be very compelling. You want it to be very beautiful because space is beautiful. And after those images were processed, it was a select few of us, very lucky few of us, who got to see the first images. So we have a team of about 30 people who are producing these images, and we feel incredibly privileged to be the ones were the first to see these science-like images. When, when we saw the first data come down of real targets, people were speechless and there were emotions because we immediately we could see how amazing this observatory will be. The detail, the sharpness, the depth. And when we saw the first color images, we knew that we had a winner. And now, we are ready to see Webb's first image of a star dying, a planetary nebula called the Southern Ring. Let's do it. Oof. Wow. wow, wow. This, this near-infrared image is, wow, the detail. Oh! <laughs> Wow, okay, well, here we are. We have a near-infrared image on our left, or on maybe your right, <laughs> and here on the right we have a near-infrared image. Um, and so I'm here with Carl, our, our astronomer uh, specialist. Can you tell us what we're looking at in these images? So this is a planetary nebula. It's caused by a dying star that has expelled a large fraction of its mass over in successive waves. Okay, so we actually see those waves in these images. Yes. Um, Wow, wow. And so there's a lot of structure. Can you tell us a little more detail about what we're looking, maybe start with this one on the left? Yeah, so in the, in the near cam image, you see this kind of bubbly, uh, you know, almost foamy appearance throughout the whole nebula with some very structured uh, shells. But the, and this foaminess is showing up in orange mainly. And this is, this is due to the molecular hydrogen that's newly formed in the expansion, uh, just lighting up the gas and dust of this nebula. And then as we move inward, you see this kind of very uh, blue haze in the inner region. And this is actually due to very hot ionized gas that emits well in the blue um, that's heated by the core, the leftover very hot core of this star. And what about these like rays that I'm seeing in this image? Right, there, so there's also rays in the outer regions that you can kind of see. And these are holes in the inner nebula that are actually allowing the, the central star's light to come out and kind of light it up like, uh, you know, patchy clouds with the sun shining through. Wow. Oh, yeah, that's what it looks like. That's so cool. Um, so you're actually a mid-infrared astronomer, which is different than near-infrared. And so what can you tell us about the details in this mid-infrared image? So this is, it looks quite different in color, um, partly because we're, we're seeing different kinds of physics going on here. So we're actually seeing in the blue, you see a lot of blue. The blue is actually due to hydrocarbon grains that are emitting very strongly in the blue for Miri. And they show the very similar structures to what we see in orange and near cam because the, the hydrocarbon, the molecular hydrocarbon actually forms on the surface of dust grains. 
And so again, as we move inward, we, we see that, that the inner region is again hot ionized gas, but now it glows red because that's where it emits longest for, uh, strongest for Miri wavelengths. Okay. And then as we go into the center, we see kind of the surprise for us, which is we knew this was a binary star, but we, ba we effectively didn't really see much of, the, of the, the actual star that produced the nebula. But now in Miri, this star glows red because it has dust around it. So in Miri, we got to see both stars very clearly. Yeah, yeah, you can't see it in first image really, but there's two stars there. So that's a fun surprise. Um, and I think that there's another little Easter egg you want to tell us about? Yeah, so this was, uh, the Easter egg is this kind of uh, narrow filament up in, the, up in the top that's radially aligned. You can kind of see it very clearly in the Miri image. It shows up as this blue, blue structure and it points very much to the central sources. So I thought, oh, this must just be a density enhancement in the outer nebula. I thought that very, very strongly, but other people on the team were like, no, it's a background edge on galaxy. Well, I made a bet that said, no, it's part of the nebula. By the way, I lost the bet because then we looked more carefully at both the near cam and mirror images, and it's very clearly an edge on galaxy with a dust lane and a bulge. So I lost the bet. Well, you lost the bet, but you got these gorgeous images. Oh. So I think it's a win for everybody. Win. Anything else you'd like to say today? I can't wait to see where we go from here. Oh, neither can I. All right. Thanks so much. Back to you, Michelle. Thank you, Alex and Carl. And I have to say that image is absolutely spectacular. So as you know, people from all over the world are watching us today and joining in, a, in our excitement as we release for Webb's first science images. We've been checking in with our colleagues in Europe and Canada throughout the program, but we also want to take a moment to include the people at the oh so many viewing parties scattered around the world like stars in the night sky. So let's check in with some of them now. First, we go all the way to Perth, Australia. Do we have a signal from Perth? I guess nothing from Perth right now. Uh, maybe we have some of our other feeds. We're gonna check in with them right now. Do we have Winnipeg, Canada? Oh, there it is, there's Australia, there's Perth. Hey, waving to Perth, Australia. Thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, next we're going to Winnipeg, Winnipeg, Canada. Hello, Winnipeg. At a planetarium, everybody's enjoying the show, I hope. Okay, Dayton, Ohio. <laughs> everybody's watching on the, uh, there we go, Dayton, Ohio. Hello, everybody, Dayton. Nice to have you here with us. There we go, yes. Hey, hey, Dayton. Hey, <laughs> they're jumping up and down. <laughs> Hi. Okay, all the way, Bangalore, India. India, Bangalore. Hello, hello, hello to Bangalore, India. Hey. <laughs> it's absolutely wonderful. Hey. <laughs> okay. So I, I, I hope you enjoy the, the rest of the images we're releasing. Okay, of course, NASA's family extends all over the country. The team at JPL in Pasadena, California, they're on site to celebrate with us. So hello, JPL. Some of my favorite people in the world. Hey, hello. And I think the last place we're going to right now is Northrop Grumman, one of our major contractors. Hello, Northrop Grumman. Oh, hey, all right. <laughs> Yay. Nice to see you, Northrop Grumman. All right, now there's also a big watch party right here on the NASA Goddard campus. Many of these people have worked on the mission itself, and we also have top NASA leadership and representatives from our government. So hello, <laughs> hello watch party at Goddard, yay. Okay, wonderful. So, I mean, at NASA, we are so fortunate to have all of these friends and colleagues around the globe. A major partner in the Webb mission is the European Space Agency. ESA contributions have been essential to so many aspects of this project, including Webb's spectacular launch on the Ariane 5 rocket last December. I'm very pleased to turn over the show for a few minutes to Katie Haswell. She's joining me from the European Space Operations Center in Darmstadt, Germany. Hello, Katie, good afternoon. Thanks, Michelle. Thank you, Michelle, and welcome to Germany. We're at the European Space Agency. I'm still getting all kinds of IFB from lots of center. 
And it's where the teams effectively fly the satellites in a little bit uh, of a cross between air traffic controllers and uh, pilots. We have lots of different control rooms here. This is the main control room and as you can see today it's not in use so we've been lucky enough to uh, move in here for today. I have two very special um, experts with me, both scientists from the European Space Agency. Uh, uh, Giovanna Giardino is a uh, near spec scientist. Giovanna okay. is, uh, has been working on that for, for many years and lots to tell us about that. And Mark McCorcoran is a special advisor for space, for science and exploration. These two guys have been working on the Webb Space Telescope for a long time. So we're very grateful to have you with us. Thanks, folks. Thank you. Um, Pleasure. We, we are excited to reveal our image with you. But before we do that, we thought we'd give you a little bit of background um, because we've come here today uh, because these guys were the first ones uh, to pick up the signal uh, during the uh, web launch, when web first launched. They run a system called S-Track, which is NASA's deep space uh, tracking system, and they were listening out when Webb called home. And uh, the controllers here have been looking after a whole very, very impressive list of missions since uh, 1968. ESA has played a very, very important role during the Webb, uh, for the Webb Space Telescope. They provided the launch on board the awesome Ariane 5 launch vehicle from the Guiana Space Center. The atmosphere in the Mission Control Center was uh, electric, I can tell you I was there. Um, they've also provided people. We have 15 ESA scientists working at uh, Space Telescope in Baltimore, and also they have provided the um, uh, infrared uh, spectrograph, the near-infrared spectrograph, and also half of the MIRI instrument, which is the mid-infrared instrument. Let's take a look at those now. Webb's four scientific instruments include NearSpec, the near-infrared spectrograph led by ESA. NearSpec splits near-infrared light from astronomical objects into its components. Like a barcode, this will help scientists understand the physics of the objects they're observing, from their temperature to atomic makeup. NearSpec can observe parts of an object or the sky using an image slicer and an array of microscopic shutters. Webb's Integrated Science Instrument Module, located behind the main mirror, also contains MIRI, a mid-infrared camera and spectrograph. Seen here during testing, MIRI has been developed by a partnership between Europe and the US. MIRI detects mid-infrared light from planets, stars and galaxies. It can analyse molecules to help us deduce what astronomical objects are made of and peer into clouds of gas and dust where stars and planets are born. Together, these instruments will help Webb detect and analyse light from the very dawn of time, revealing the universe as never before. So, so let's get ready to reveal our image. And remember that one of Webb's jobs is to find out about galaxies, more about the galaxies, but also to help us to understand how they change. And this image is going to be very, very useful for that. Let's reveal it now. There it is. It's called Stefan's Quintet and it's wondrous. Giovanna, what are we looking at? Yes, like you said, a quintet. So we are looking at five galaxies. Galaxies are uh, this giant structure that as we've seen, we see everywhere around us in the universe. They contain from million to 100 billions of stars. And in fact, we live in one of them, the Milky Way. And here we see uh, five of them. This is a, a closer um, a galaxy uh, in the foreground. And these four are uh, at a distance of about uh, uh, 300 uh, uh, million light years from us. And they're locked uh, in a close interaction, a sort of cosmic dance driven by the uh, gravitational force. Um, you can see here yeah, these two uh, in a process of merging 
uh, within each other. This is a very important image uh, and, and area to study because it really shows uh, the type of interaction that drives the evolution of galaxies. That, that, uh, that's the mechanism of galaxies' growth. I love this image of the cosmic dance <laughs> moving through each other. Uh, Mark, there's a lot going on, though, in this image, isn't there? There is. So this is a near-infrared image and a mid-infrared infrared image combined. And when we zoom in on the uh, left-hand side here, we see this foreground galaxy. We see lots of individual stars in there actually resolved as point sources, which is remarkable. And then as we pan across, we actually see the, the galaxies in the, the merging galaxies. We now see gas and dust, which is being heated up in the collision between those galaxies. And that's a place where new stars are being born today. So we're actually seeing the process of creation of new stars in this region. And then when we look in the background here, we see not only the galaxies at 300 million light years, but also stars in our own galaxy, these um, snowflake uh, structures that you see here, those are nearby stars, but in the corner and around the edges we see galaxies which are much, much more distant, much further away. So similar in some sense to the ones that we saw earlier on in that deep field. And so this image actually takes us from the nearby galaxy, our own Milky Way, through these galaxies which are evolving today all the way to the distant universe. And it, in a way it captures cosmic evolution of galaxies over those 13.8 billion years. So we have another image, don't we, that we can exactly. look at? Exactly. So, so if we strip away the near-infrared view there of the stars predominantly now in the mid-infrared with MIRI alone, we see mostly gas and dust. So we've seen the same galaxies again, the two merging. And then we also see something very interesting up at the top here because this top galaxy has something new and bright in the middle of it. And Giovanna, tell us what that is. Yeah, that's uh, an active black hole. We cannot see the black hole itself but we see the material swirling around, being swallowed by these sort of cosmic monsters, and it gets, uh, this gas gets heated to extremely high temperature as it falls onto the black hole, and it becomes very bright. In fact, this is how shiny is the galaxy. Here we see uh, luminosity that are 40 billion times the luminosity of our suns. It's really, really bright. And uh, with NIRSPEC, we can zoom into this area, and we have this technology that allows us to take uh, uh, thousands of images of different wavelength channels, uh, so see the, uh, the, the, this distribution of the gas, what's going on in the gas, uh, in different regions uh, of, of this core area, and understand the, the composition of the gas, the velocities, um, the temperature, so that's imp very important to understand the physics. So of it's, it's giving us so much information, and it just shows the power of this telescope. Mark, this is just the beginning though, isn't it? I think that's a very important takeaway from today. You know, we, these are like pictures just taken over a period of five days, and every five days we're getting more data which will contribute more in that, in that direction. It's a culmination of decades of work, but it's just the beginning of decades. And you know, what we've seen today with these images is essentially that we're ready now. This telescope is working fantastically well. And you know, to, to, to borrow a phrase from a famous rock musician, you know, we're ready to turn this telescope up to 11. It really is time, it's fantastic. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, both of you. Back to you, Michelle. Thanks, Katie. It is so great to have you and your colleagues with us on this historic day. So before we get to the fifth and final image reveal of the day, it cannot be said enough that an achievement like the James Webb Space Telescope is something bigger than any one of us. It's bigger than any organization, any country. This truly takes a planet. Web belongs to all of us, and starting today, the discoveries start and they're not going to stop. This is just the beginning. We've said several times throughout the broadcast that the Web mission is about people, and during the construction of the Great Telescope, people started to see themselves in it, literally. Day after day, people visited the observation window at NASA Goddard, and looking through the glass, they snapped selfies of themselves reflected in the gigantic golden mirror. These photos are actual reflections of the enormous human investment and the emotional commitment that brought this mission to life. And now, years later, that mission is finally collecting light from the earliest days of the universe, all the way to worlds in our own solar system. It's the same mirror that reflected the many faces who see themselves as part of the journey to understand our shared origins. Let's stop for a moment and appreciate the people behind Webb. Okay, it's time now for the last image to be revealed. Here we go.
So Amber Strawn is Webb's Deputy Project Scientist. He's here with me today to share the final big reveal of the day. So Amber, it is so good to see you. How are you feeling? Oh, so great, so exciting. What a, what a great day this is. Yeah, so one of the things that we're gonna do is before we get to the final image, the James Webb Space Telescope has taken us all over the universe today. So let's do a quick review of where we've been so far. So Jane Rigby got us rolling today with an extraordinary new deep field image, showing us one of the farthest views of the universe ever. Yeah, this image really does demonstrate that JWST can do exactly what we've designed it to do. Yes. And uh, the Canadian Space Agency then took us to the massive planet WASP-96b, where the team has detected evidence of atmospheric water. And here again, we're seeing the incredible efficiency of this observatory. We're able to do these kind of measurements in a fraction of the time that we are, were able to before. And then we zipped up the road from NASA Goddard to the Space Telescope Science Institute, where Alex and Carl showed us the exquisite Southern Ring Nebula, a mixing bowl of stellar matter around a pair of dying stars. Yeah, and I'm just blown away by the level of detail we can see, like in the outer part of, of this nebula. It's incredible. Wow. Okay. After that, it was off to Germany, where the European Space Agency wowed us with pictures of galaxies interacting and mixing together. Right, and this image, again, it's just, it's incredible because it's showing us one of these fundamental processes of the universe, how galaxies merge together, and we're able to learn about these processes in a brand new way. <laughs> so the web team has a lot to cheer about right now. So across the campus, there's this big watch party, and we can feel the excitement all the way from over here. So let's join that celebration now. We're back with senior project scientist John Mather, along with the head of NASA Science Mission Director, Thomas Zerbuchen. Hello. So, uh, John, we looked around the world and we're the only ones with a cheerleading <laughs> crew right over there. This is amazing. Uh, look, uh, you've been with this mission for decades. Uh, how do you feel today? I am so thrilled and so relieved. This was so hard and we took, it took so long. Um, it's just impossible to convey how hard it really was. That we risked so much to say we're going to go do this and it's so near impossible. But we did it. Yeah, there are thousands, way, thousands of ways this can go wrong. Yes. Uh, many of them, uh, you know, we worried about and, and frankly feared even after launch. I have to tell you, I was really, really nervous. And, you know, it's almost like athletics for me. You always get to know the team when they're on the field. And on the field, they were right after this launch, and they were perfect. They absolutely were. And I really wasn't worried, but maybe I should have been. Yeah, that's that's difference between the two of us. I always worry. I always tell everybody I'm paid to worry, uh, frankly, uh, and, and, and that's good. Uh, what we want to do, though, is, you know, just really thank the team again. You know, of course, we heard uh, Bill and Scott and uh, Greg talking about the team that is there. I think what's also important is to recognize that Bernie is sitting there. It was the first uh, manager. I was sitting there. Could you stand up? And... Uh, and I want to mention that Phil Sablehouse, who is a manager uh, also during a time, is no longer with us, but uh, his heart is with us today. Yeah. I, I have to tell you, I have to tell you, John, uh, after each one of these milestones, I called a lot of people. I called Bernie, for example, and I called uh, people who had my job and people who are administrators because there's many of them. And I just wonder how you feel about the team, just to uh, give you the word here. I am just so thrilled that we had a privilege to assemble such a brilliant team. Uh, we drew from the best of the best, and here we are. So my extreme deep thanks go to all the people who built that team, not only to Bernie, who started us and helped us build up all the technology, to Phil, who made sure we would have a plan, and then when we didn't have quite enough money, to Bill, who pulled it all together and made it get all the way to the end I am so thrilled that we had so much talent to draw on. And here we are, we have the support of the country and the world to take on this immense challenge. You know what I'm most excited about? There's tens of thousands of scientists, and frankly, some of them just got born, or not even born, yeah. uh, who, are, who are benefiting from this amazing telescope, because it will be with us for decades. It will be. That. We have... It took us about 25 years to get here since 1995, and we have at least 25 to go, I hope. 
So look, uh, we are in a sense of awe of these images, the art that is out there in the sky revealed for the first time. We're thinking of the team and we're thanking them. John, thanks to you, thanks to all of you, and back to Michelle. Thank you so much, Thomas. And this entire collection continues to just absolutely astound me. Okay, Amber, so here it is. Can you walk us through the final image reveal? <laughs> absolutely, here we go. The last image is, wow, look at that. So Amber, can you, can you tell us a bit about what we're seeing here? Of course. This stunning vista of the cosmic cliffs of the Carina Nebula reveals new details about this vast stellar nursery. Today, for the first time, we're seeing brand new stars that were previously completely hidden from our view. Is there something you want to point out here? Absolutely. So. Honestly, it took me a while to even figure out what to call out in this image. There's just so much going on here. It's so beautiful. One thing that really, really stands out to me is you sort of get this sense of depth and texture from this new data. Um, there's just, there's a lot going on. To call out a few specifics, first of all, in general, the Carina Nebula is a nearby star forming region within our own Milky Way galaxy, about 7,600 light years away. Um, and in this view, we see some great examples, first of all, of hundreds of new stars that we've never seen before. We see examples of bubbles and cavities and jets that are being blown out by these newborn stars. We even see some galaxies sort of lurking in the background up here. We see examples of structures that Honestly, we don't even know what they are. Like, what's going on here? There's just, there's, the data is just so rich. And there's something really special about the infrared. Infrared can actually see deeper into these star forming regions. Absolutely, that's one of the great things about infrared is it really does reveal uh, what's going on here in a, in a really cosmic sense. And in general, what's happening in sort of this overall landscape is we have these gigantic hot young stars up here to the top of this rim and the radiation and stellar winds from those stars is sort of pushing down and running into all of this. This is gas and dust. And of course, we know that gas and dust is great raw material for newborn stars and baby planets. But there's a flip side of this story and also a little bit of a mystery because these same processes can serve to sort of erode away this material and stop star formation. So we have this sort of delicate balance going on of new stars being formed, but at the same time, the star formation is being halted. Mm -hmm. And for me, when I see an image like this, I can't help but think about scale. You know, every dot of light we see here is an individual star, not unlike our sun, and many of these likely also have planets. And it just reminds me that, you know, our sun and our planets and ultimately us were formed out of the same kind of stuff that we see here. We humans really are connected to the universe. We're made of the same stuff in this beautiful landscape. And actually, the Carina Nebula was one of my favorite images from Hubble. So Hubble looked at this as well, right? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. The Hubble image of this is also spectacular. We saw it in a, a different kind of light when, when Hubble uh, took an image of this, of this uh, particular nebula. And then you can see amazing things with Hubble, but when we zoom in to this new image, we're able to see so much more detail. And of course, all of us, you know, I grew up <laughs> on Hubble and all of us uh, love Hubble. And I'm just, I'm so excited to see what these two amazing observatories are able to do really in tandem with each other. Thank you so much. And again, congratulations. It's been a pleasure to be working on this with you. I I'm just amazed by what's been going on. I am too, thank you. <laughs> So as we're wrapping up, one of the things that I really have to say is the, the, the journey that we've been going on is so very dramatic for me. So we've gone all the way from the birth of stars and we have all the way from the distant galaxies to the birth of stars. This is where we all began. This was the whole point of the James Webb Space Telescope to figure out our origins from the very, very early days of the universe to star and planet formation very nearby. So right now I'm very honored to have our last special guest. Uh, this is the administrator of NASA, Bill Nelson. An honor to be with you, sir. Hey, what a pleasure. What, what a banner day. Uh, it's clear that Webb represents the best of NASA. It maintains our ability to propel us forward for science, for risk-taking, for inspiration. 
And we don't want to ever stop exploring the heavens nor stop daring to take another step forward for humanity. In the words of the famous Carl Sagan, somewhere something incredible is waiting to be known. I think those words are becoming reality. Absolutely. Thanks, Michelle. An honor to have you here. Thank you very much. Wow. So this is a celebration for all humanity. If you've ever looked up at the night sky and wonder, whoever you are, wherever you are, this is your telescope. And we also salute the thousands of people who have dedicated part of their lives to making Weber reality. I also want to give a big shout out for the superb media team who's helped bring Web story to the world. This broadcast is a joint effort of the superstar producers, animators, and social media specialists at the Canadian Space Agency, ESA, NASA, and especially the Goddard Space Flight Center. Web captures light in distant colors that the eye can't see, and you've actually made this visible to the world. So finally, if you go to nasa.gov slash webfirstimages, you can download all of the images and data we've just shown in full resolution, and check back often. From now on, we share new discoveries for exciting new destinations around the universe. July 12th, 2022 marks a huge day for science. It's only just the beginning. For everyone at CSA, ESA, and NASA, I'm so very pleased you could join us. I'm Michelle Fowler. Go Web.
Thank you.
Thank you.
Thank you.
Hello, everyone, and welcome to our media briefing today for the James Webb Space Telescope, an international mission led by NASA with our partners, the European Space Agency and the Canadian Space Agency. Uh, my name is Elise Fisher. I'm with NASA's Office of Communications, and uh, we are here live today from NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland, where we have just released the full set of the first full color images and spectroscopic data from the Webb mission. Uh, so we have a panel of experts here to answer your questions today about the images and the data that you've just seen, uh, as well as what that means for Webb's ability to explore the unknown in our universe. Uh, but first, I would like to turn it over to Eric Smith, uh, Webb's program scientist and chief scientist of our astrophysics division at NASA headquarters uh, for some opening thoughts. Thanks, Elise. Uh, well, this morning we saw the amazing data that uh, Webb has given us. Uh, we certainly thank all the scientists and engineers who have spent decades developing this amazing machine. It is now the science community that must take this uh, unbelievable instrument we have been given and turn it into knowledge. Uh, another thing you probably got out of this morning's briefing was that there are discoveries in these data, and because they were more or less practice uh, runs with the instruments, we're making discoveries and we really haven't even started trying yet. So uh, the promise of this uh, telescope is amazing. And of course, uh, as Elise said, we couldn't have done this uh, at NASA without our partners uh, in the uh, European Space Agency and the Canadian Space Agency. I want to thank the scientists who have been supportive and patient for the many years that it has taken us to uh, put Webb together. Uh, I know you will be happy with the results that you get out of it. Uh, equally important, this is a telescope for the world, and it, that's why we want to uh, have you uh, part of the story that we tell everyone. It's important to get this out. The world's vehicle for deepest space exploration is open for business. All aboard. Thank you, Eric. Um, so with that, we will begin to take questions, um, and I'd like to introduce our panelists uh, who are here to address them. In addition to Eric Smith, we have Nicole Colon, Webb Deputy Project Scientist for Exoplanet Science uh, here at NASA Goddard. We have Christopher Evans, Webb Project Scientist for the European Space Agency. Klaus Pontopadon, Webb Project Scientist for the Space Telescope Science Institute. We have Rene Doyon, Principal Investigator for the Near Infrared Imager and Slitless Spectrograph, or Nearest Instrument, aboard Webb with the University of Montreal. We have Amber Strawn, Webb's Deputy Project Scientist for Communications here at NASA Goddard. And finally, Jane Rigby, Webb Project, or Operations Project Scientist, uh, also here at NASA Goddard. So we are going to take questions today, uh, both here in the room as well as from media who are on the phone lines calling in from around the world. Uh, so we have two members of our team who will, if you raise your hand, um, provide a microphone for you to ask your question. Uh, and we'd ask that when you do so, you please let us know your name and your outlet as well. Um, and if you do know which member of the panel you'd like to direct that to, please feel free to note that as well. So let's start with some questions here in the room. Thank you. Seth Borenstein, the Associated Press. Two questions, if you don't mind. First, for Nicole, um, for the average person who sort of was hoping to see a picture of an exoplanet, instead you, we see the spectrum. Can you tell us why that is so in interesting and important? What it really, why is that better than a picture, and what does it tell you? And, and for Eric, if we go back to last night's a uh, deep field image, or someone else's better, you know, prefers to answer this. Um, I know, is, is it too early? It's too early to say how far back this shows. Can you give us a range, since you're saying this is further and deeper? I mean, um, I keep hearing 13, more than 13 million, billion, but you've had more than 13 billion before. So where are we looking? Are we looking at five or 600 billion? after, I mean, 500, 600 million after the Big Bang or what, you know, and thank you. Uh, 
Sure. So with the exoplanet transit spectrum that we released today, um, which came out of NEARS instrument, which uh, Rene Doyon is a PI of, so I uh, just want to make sure we acknowledge him as well. Um, that spectrum is definitely an indirect method, right, of how we study exoplanets. And, and the thing is, compared to direct imaging, so Webb will also do direct imaging and take some pictures of known planets, and it will also search for as yet undiscovered planets with direct imaging. But in this case, um, we know that at least for cycle one observations, the first year of science, transit observations are a heavy part of the science program. So this first image or spectrum really represents what the community has proposed so far. And a lot of the direct imaging capabilities, though, they'll be demonstrated over the next year. And then that will also be a big part of Webb's story moving forward. I'll start on the deep field question, and then I'm going to toss it over to Jane, who's the, the real expert on that. We know from taking spectra in that field that we have, there's at least one object uh, that is 13.1 uh, billion years, uh, and that's how long the light has taken to get to us. So we know from uh, other data, Hubble and whatnot, that we can see a little bit past that, 13.4, 13.5. So, uh, what this tells me, though, is that Webb, again, practicing with Webb, we almost got there to what Webb was built for. So when we do a program specifically designed to look for those uh, farthest objects, we will get there. And I'll let Jane elaborate. That's most of it. Um, yeah, so the spectroscopic redshifts that we got in that field include a, a redshift 8.5. So that's the look back time of 13.1 of billion years. And what's remarkable is just how good the spectra are without long integrations. You just, oh my, okay, there you go. I mean, we're, we're used to barely being able to tell the redshift, and instead we have a spectrum that has so many lines, you can say, oh, I can tell you how, much ox how many oxygen atoms there are in that galaxy. And so, yes, it's not the record holder because we're just getting started. This is the proof that it works, and that when we take these kinds of data, it, it goes really deep. As far as deeper images than the UDF, um, you know, that's based on examining the images and figuring out what is the deepest, what's the faintest blob that we're seeing. And we're confident that that's deeper than images that Hubble has taken in the same wavelengths. I mean, honestly, it's not hard to do that. A couple of hours and you beat Hubble in those wavelengths. Just, just to follow on from Jane, so um, we've seen one of, the, one of the first spectra was shown in the broadcast. And you'll see in the products that um, we've actually used the near the near spec spectrograph, the multi-object capability. So we have this deep field taken with NearCam, and we can use the near spec multi-object spectrograph that was one of the ESA deliverables to observe more than one galaxy at a time. So we can really make the most of this precious observing time. And um, I think there was 48 in that first test. And again, we'll be doing this following up these deep fields with this capability to get the spectra of tens of galaxies each time. And those lines just pop right out, and you can do things we couldn't imagine of just last week. So. If I may add. Um, the, this, this target is very special because it was observed by all four science instruments. For example, NIRIS has a mode to do, like NIRSPEC, to take spectra, but this, in this case it takes spectra of everything with slightly less sensitivity, but instead of a, a few tens of objects you can observe, there's a thousand of objects in, in one shot you can observe. And so, uh, yeah, so the, this, this galaxy clusters represent this very tight and strong synergy for all four science instruments working to, together to answer one fundamental question, the origin of the universe. Great, thank you all. Um, we can take another question here in the room. Um, hi, this is Issam Ahmed from AFP. Uh, maybe for Eric, the, uh, two questions. Maybe the first one is, um, uh, or for Amber, I'm not sure. What are the, are there any interesting um, scientific questions thrown up from the practice images we've seen so far? Are there any kind of lines of investigation that you would want to pursue from, on the basis of what we've just seen? And the second question, maybe, I don't know, Klaus, um, just for the public's knowledge, how long does it take to sort of process these spectacular images from infrared into these kind of really colorful, beautiful um, photos we see, and what does that involve? Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna let Amber go ahead and take, take that one. With the, uh, with the deep image, of course, the first thing we think about are those very, very distant galaxies, like Jane describes them, the rubies, you know, scattered across that image. 
Um, I study star forming properties in sort of intermediate redshift galaxies and also galaxy morphologies. And for me, the first thing that stood out about that image, in addition to the little red dots, which are great, um, but was just the astounding detail that you can see in some of these galaxies. You can see uh, star forming regions in what are almost certainly, you know, very distant galaxies. Um, and you just, I mean, they just pop out. There's just so much more detail. It's like, you know, we've used this, this kind of corny acronym, but it's like seeing in high def, right? Um, and just the, the detailed morph morphology structures that we see uh, in this image, is, it's, it's fantastic. Right, so I, I can answer the other question. Um, so I think on average, we spend probably a couple of weeks uh, on each image end to end from actually getting the data on a telescope, downloading them, and then processing them through this whole process before we got you know, what you see on the, on the screen there. There's a lot of stuff involved. And in, in some way, we're, we, we, know, we know that we're sort of the first science users, like the first people who had to actually take data from the telescope and create a, a, a product that you can do science with or that, had, that is such high quality if you look at the images, but also when you zoom in on it and you zoom in and you look at details, that, that every detail you see is going to be real. Um, and I just wanted to highlight as well for the uh, near-spec spectra that, that, that we have seen, those, those amazing spectra that others have talked about. Uh, those were only taken at the very end of June. So in that case, we, we spent, you only had a few days to, to get those spectra. So this is still a testament for how powerful this observatory is that you can get the quality of data that you can turn around. For the first time, we're doing this for science, right? in just a few days. Hey, thanks a lot, guys. Um, Bill Horowitz, CBS News. And this, I'm not sure who to ask this, maybe Jane or Amber. Um, can you talk about when you, when you saw the actual data and your impressions or, or your anticipation going in, what I'm trying to understand your reactions as both astronomers and human beings to seeing this thing turn this dream into reality for you. In other words, did it match that? Did, did the reality match the dream? Do you view this as an incremental step forward for astronomy, or is it, you know, the kind of revolutionary step that Hubble was back in its day? Can can y'all just give us a little perspective on? Well, anyway, you, you got it. You get sure. It, so. Okay. Let me take that. Okay, so I'm one of the three commissioning scientists, so I've seen a lot, maybe most of the data that's come down during the six-month commissioning period. And I will say that for me, earlier than this, that the first focused images that we took where they were razor sharp, that for me was the one where I had the very emotional reaction of, oh my goodness, it works. And it works better than we thought. And shortly after that, we got a standard star so we could measure how much light was going through the telescope. And that's not pretty, it's just a star, but like, oh my gosh, it really does work. And so for me, definitely, it was the, I think, personally, I went and had an ugly cry, okay? I just, and yeah, um, because it works, it, the, what the engineers have done to build this thing, it is amazing. We have an amazing engineering team, and across the board, we beat spec. Um, some of those engineers are in this room right now, Mike Menzel and his team, like, it just, they beat spec again and again and again. So I will say, for, it was a combination of giddy in the room, looking at the data, oh my god, this is great. And then, like, going and having a little sob, because it works. As far as what does this mean, the first thing I did when I came on this project 11 years ago was I made a plot of how deep does this telescope supposed to go versus what does everybody else do? And I, because nobody had made that plot. I was like, I don't, I'm just trying to get my, wrap my head around it. I was like, oh my gosh, we're two orders of magnitude more sensitive than other telescopes. And it goes to three, right? Like, okay, how could you not discover stuff if you're a hundred times more powerful than previous telescopes? So from what, the data that I've seen so far from the work that we've, um, that we've seen in commissioning, which is all commissioning data, and then this first week of science, yeah, this is going to be revolutionary. These are incredible capabilities that we've never had before. If I can pick up on this. Um, yeah, I'm also the, uh, I'm part of the uh, commissioning team as PI at the uh, FGS and nearest instrument provided by CSA. And, um, you know, I'm a scientist, so I've, I've been working on this project for 20 years. So we should expect what we, what, what we saw. But no, uh, several times in the last six months, I nearly break my jaw of what I saw. 
these incredible images and the first transiting uh, exoplanet spectrum in front of me coming right out of the box of, of, of the data. It was just amazing. And so, uh, and I, I think our fellow scientists will feel the same thing when it, we look at the data. These data are just amazing. I, I think it's fair to say that today we're turning the page. It's a cliche, but it's true. We're turning the page on several new chapters on exoplanet, atmosphere, the early universe, star formation, you name it. And we don't even know what we're going to find. It's exciting. Uh, we can take another question in the room here. Thanks. Jeff Faust of Space News. Uh, I know the early release observations are designed to showcase the broad scope of what uh, JWST can do. And I know one of the important areas of science for JWST is solar system science. So when can we expect the first solar system images or spectra from JWST? Um, well, so uh, there, there have already been solar system observations taken. Um, and so those observations will be released on Thursday, along with the rest of the commissioning data. So that's when the public will see the first ones. Um, and we're very keenly aware that, that this is an important science area for the observatory. We also very confident that we know that, that we can produce wonderful, beautiful data and images for this. And so I actually have, I have no doubt that we're going to see spectacular things from the solar system soon. It was just an early decision made for the early release observations that we didn't want to have to count on the the moving target observations working with it, They're keeping things you know, not too complicated. As it actually turns out, we probably could have done it, but you know, here we are. Thanks, Jeff. Sure. Um, we, will, uh, we will come back to questions in the room in a moment, but uh, we actually on the phone lines have uh, media who are live at the Canadian Space Agency headquarters in Quebec. Uh, and so we have some media questions on the line uh, that we can go to now. So I'd like to ask our operator to please uh, provide instructions for our phone uh, media to ask questions and, and take our first question there. If you'd like to ask a question at this time, please press star one and clearly record your first and last name for your question to be introduced. Again, that is star one. One moment, please. Our first question comes from Kenneth King with New York Times. Your line is now open. Hi, uh, thank you. I was wondering when will the first year program observations begin? And can you tell us who's going to be first? <laughs> Klaus, you go ahead. So the first year of science observations have already begun. We, we have already taken data for scientists to one time in, in, the, first, in the first year. And those data uh, will be released uh, to the principal investigators of those programs um, uh, in, in the next day or two. And um, some of them are public, actually. So it will be released to the world as well. So there's, there's another batch of data there. And we're just going full steam ahead. Uh, what are the first ones? There's actually various different, different first ones there. Uh, there, there are more um, deep field data, for example. So that's very exciting. Um, a program called SEERS, which, which looks at wider regions. Remember that the deep field we have here is, is a very small region that goes deep, but many of the programs, they are looking at observing many more galaxies, many, many thousands in a wide area, wider area of the sky. So there's some of that. Um, and you can, you can go to, uh, to our website as well and look up what, uh, what observations are being taken every week. So there's a schedule published there. Thank you, Klaus. Uh, we can take another question from the phone as well now. OK, our next question comes from Andrea Matt with the Canadian Space Agency. Your line is now open. Thank you. This is a question from Raymond Fournier from the Agence Science Presse in Canada, for René Doyon. We know the rate of expansion of the universe through Hubble images. Will Webb redefine this? We don't expect Webb to focus on, on, on that. And Webb will uh, very focus on the early universe. I mean, you've seen this, this deep image 
and uh, uh, we don't expect web to, uh, but who knows uh, whether, I mean, that's maybe a question for James to, to answer. Um, I think the main way that Webb can contribute to understanding the age and the expansion rate of the universe is the nearby part, the near is uh, figuring out the distance ladder, the distances to Cepheid stars and uh, red giant stars in nearby galaxies. That's what sets that ladder that walks out into cosmological scales. And dust gets in the way of, of it's one of the, dust is the largest source of error in many of those measurements. And so there are multiple approved programs in the first year to go observe uh, these, these standard candle or standardizable stars uh, to understand the distances to nearby galaxies, which then lets us leapfrog out uh, and, and measure the expansion rate of the universe. Thank you both. Uh, oh, go ahead, Chris, if you'd like to add. Just to add to that, on coming back to the transformational question earlier. So in, in Stefan's Quintet, you've got the galaxy on the left-hand side, which is slightly closer, NGC 7320, um, and that's a what, 40 million light years, and at the moment we just can't go and resolve the stellar populations in a galaxy like that. And suddenly in that image, as someone said on the broadcast, you can see the whole populations, you can see the star clusters, you can see evolved luminous red supergiants, AGB stars that are producing dust. And then we can go and look in these galaxies out to these tens of millions of light years to do the work that James was just mentioning, to build that ladder um, in a way that if you try and do this with Hubble, it's just not sensitive enough. If you try and do it from the ground, you can't get out to that distance or the dust is in the way. And so it's just, and when you've got the myriad observations as well at longer wavelengths to broaden the wavelength coverage, it's going to be hugely powerful. Uh, we can take one more question from the phone line before we come back to the room here. Okay, the next question comes from Christopher Kokinos with Astronomy, Astrology Magazine. Your line is not open. Thank you. Yeah, that's Astronomy Magazine, just to be clear. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, I wish I was in the room to see the reaction. Uh, <laughs> um, first, congratulations, everybody. Um, really incredible stuff. Um, and I know that you know we've heard terms like amazing, revolutionary, exciting, and so forth. Um, I'm at, I'm actually wondering if if one or two of the project scientists can can kind of compare the the web to you know, another moment in the history of astronomy or science. I mean, what do you rank this with? You know, the discovery of, of DNA, um, Galileo's first observations of the moon. I mean, where, where would you sort of rank this in comparison to other breakthroughs in, um, in astronomy? Thank you. So, so I'll, I'll take a first crack at it so everybody else has time to think of a good answer here. Uh, th this, uh, for me, it is like seeing Hubble again, but actually better because we have this uh, coverage that overlaps with Hubble and we're actually even sharper than Hubble there. So this is, again, seeing the universe in a new way that uh, while we expected we could be able to do this, to actually see it for the first time, uh, internalize it, uh, tells me that uh, everything we've planned through cycle one, the astronomical community, was bold, but it wasn't bold enough. So I'm really excited for what people now plan to do for the second cycle, seeing just how capable the facility is. So uh, for me, the closest thing uh, would be Hubble when it was repaired and we saw everything kind of snap into focus. I don't know about others, Klaus. Yeah, yeah. To, to me, um, so it's, I'm not comparing to an astronomy mission, but almost. So one of my, my favorite at least pair of missions were the Voyager missions, right? Launched about the time that I was born, still going. And I remember growing up, you know, being a kid and seeing, you know, a few years in between those first high resolution images of the outer planets. And it's one of the things that brought me into astronomy today. So I think that that's what reminds me the most of what, what Webb is seeing these things in high resolution for the first time and just going, wow, there is so much there. Yeah. I mean, if I may, uh, in a way, we may have to wait several years to answer that question because mm -hmm. uh, history shows very eloquently that uh, whenever a new facility is online and you ask the questions five, ten years later, what was the biggest discovery of that facility? Well, nobody could predict it. And in fact, we've designed this telescope and instrument to do incredible science that we're going to start uh, uh, executing now. 
but really we don't know what we're going to find. I, Hubble is a good example. You know, Hubble was to measure the Hubble constant, and it did. But nobody anticipated that they would measure the uh, universe that is accelerating. That was a Nobel Prize. So who, who knows what's coming for JWST, but I'm sure we're going to have a lot of surprises. Okay, thank you. Uh, we can come back to the room now for some questions. And actually, maybe not to make you run around, but maybe we can take one in the back there as well. Hey there, thanks so much. Uh, Emily Pandice from NBC News. Um, I have two questions for you. Do you plan to aim web at one of our local planets like Jupiter, and what do you expect to see? And our closest known exoplanet that we could possibly live on, um, it's only 4.2 light years away, so it's too far to travel to, but could you imagine its surface at that distance? And we'd love to hear about any plans you have for possibly habitable worlds. Oh, go ahead, yeah, go ahead. James. Sure. Mm -hmm. I'll take the Jupiter one. We've already pointed at Jupiter. Uh, you're actually sitting next to Begonia Vilo, who is part of why we can point at Jupiter. Um, <laughs> So one of our commissioning tests was to check that we can do moving targets, right? That we can track something moving in our solar system. We had a speed limit of 30, which is as fast as Mars can get. Um, we actually broke through that. We managed to get a speed limit of 67. So we can track faster targets than we promised um, because the guider works so great. Um, and what it, for Jupiter, we, uh, we did a test of Jupiter just because Jupiter is so bright that it's, it can be challenging to guide on it and look at the faint things like its moons. Um, but we did that test during commissioning, and it worked, and the data are in the archive. Um, and so there are, uh, there, there are programs in the first year of science, peer-reviewed approved programs, to study Jupiter and the, the Jovian system that we now are confident will execute. And then that initial data, which just a you know, couple seconds to prove, OK, yes, we can track Jupiter as it moves, uh, those will go live in the archive later this week. And those, those Jupiter images are beautiful. So nice. They made me very happy. <laughs> Great, thank you. And maybe Nicole, Renee, if you want to take the question about exoplanets as well. Sure, yeah. So I can start. Um, so for the closest exoplanet system to us, um, that one doesn't transit its star. So that's a, one of the main ways that Webb will be studying exoplanets. So it's, we can't, at the moment, use Webb to study that exoplanet system. However, uh, speaking of, you mentioned potentially habitable planets, we did a countdown with TRAPPIST-1 earlier. Um, Webb will be observing every single planet in the TRAPPIST-1 system. So there's seven planets, and several of those are considered to be in the habitable zone of that star, which means they have the right temperature that they could have liquid water on their surface. What Webb is going to do is first check whether they have an atmosphere at all. That's our first step in the process. And then check, okay, now, if we confirm there's an atmosphere, what can we tell about the composition? So it's, it's a stepwise type of um, process, but that's our, uh, our prime opportunity to study um, some potentially habitable planets around the TRAPPIST-1 star. Um, so yeah, if Renee wants to add anything to that. Yeah, well, I, I guess what I, I can add is that uh, what we've learned so far about exoplanet atmospheres is mostly around gas giants you know, and, and mini Neptunes. But we haven't really explored rocky planet. And now we have this rock star system, the TRAPPIST-1 system, as uh, Nicole mentioned. And all four science instruments will you know, observe that. Due to the first reconnaissance, as Nicole mentioned, the, do these plants have an atmosphere? And if so, what is made of? And if they ha we have a hint of an atmosphere, well, you can be sure the community will you know, put a lot of time to observe these, these trends whenever they, 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 they come around. So that's the, the focus right now. The first year will be TRAPPIST-1. Thank you both. Uh, we can take another question in the room, right up here. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Asa Stahl, Science News. I have two pretty closely related exoplanet questions for whoever wants to take them. Um, regarding WASP-96b, um, my impression was that previously our scientific understanding of that planet was that it was the most cloudless of any that had, been, had an atmosphere observed. But JWST sees clouds um, in the near-infrared or mid-infrared. Um, so what does that mean and how representative is that of what JWST can do that was previously impossible? Um, and then secondly, um, going back to kind of habitable zones, um, astronomers have been guessing for years how capable JWST would actually be at doing this sort of thing. And now you're finding that it defies expectations to some extent. So what kind of bounty can we really expect? Um, how many you know, planets in the habitable zone of around you know, even M stars 
um, do you think GWST will be able to look for atmospheres around? Okay, well, there's, there's about, a, right now, a handful of uh, habitables, uh, habitables on planet that, that we can lack and that, that we can look at. Uh, Tavius 1 is, is, is one. But just to, to give you an idea about the, the major step forward we're making today, uh, the, the main reference for exoplanet atmosphere is Hubble, and it's an incredible machine. But, and Hubble was is saying spectra with, you know, with that kind of visions in terms of wavelength wave, wave coverage. And Webb suddenly will give us, I don't know, I'm going to hit you guys. It's uh, uh, that big, you know. When you combine the, the wavelength coverage by NIRIS, NIRCAM, NIRSPEC, and MIRI, then we have suddenly access to all possible molecules. You've seen these wiggles, right? You know, Hubble can only see, on, on, can only, only see one of those. Now we have a much broader, broader picture. The other aspect is uh, Hubble is on a low orbit, so it cannot observe a transiting event very continuously. And uh, so you need to have several visits, and that's very inefficient. To obtain this kind of quality data with Hubble would take 10, 50 times more data. So Webb will be absolutely revolutionary in that, in, in that, in that respect. Sure, and then I'll add to that. Uh, so specifically for yeah, WASP-96, again, you mentioned clouds and hazes, right, that hadn't been seen in that atmosphere before. So the benefit of having a space telescope is we get above our atmosphere, right, to look for clouds and hazes in other planet atmospheres. So um, the original discovery of that um, that it was a clear atmosphere was actually based on some ground-based data. And so now we have kind of the full picture. So the ground-based data covered a, a part of the optical visible light spectrum. And now we have a better picture pushing in to the near-infrared with nearest. So we can better understand, okay, what, what layers in the atmosphere might have clouds? Because that's also part of the stories that we're able to tell the structure of the atmosphere, not just what's in it. Um, and then, yeah, going to the point of, you know, more habitable zone planets, uh, Web, Web will, I think, the community will encourage Web to target as many as they can. Um, part of the problem is it just takes time. <laughs> you know, it, we have to observe transits exactly when they happen, and they only happen every so often, um, especially for a planet in the habitable zone. It can be five to ten days for the smallest star, um, much longer if you look at Earth. So, so it takes time. So that's in some ways our, our main limitation is literal telescope time. <laughs> Thank you both. Uh, we can take another question in the room here. Thank you. Hi, I'm Marina Korn with The Atlantic. Uh, my first question is probably for Jane and Amber. Can you tell us more about the tiny details that we're seeing in that Carina Nebula image? And then for my, my second question is for anyone who would like to take it, how does an image like that make you feel? Uh, sure. So for, for Karina, um, a lot of the, the detailed structure we're seeing is, doing to, is due to uh, these newborn stars because newborn stars are very energetic. They have these massive stellar winds. And so you see these examples of sort of bubbles <laughs> and cavities. And um, that, that sort of structure is all due to the fact that this is a, this sort of stellar nursery where these stars are being born. Um, and yeah, and that image too, sort of like the deep build, it's just, there's so much in it. You know, um, if you even look like up at the very top of that Karina uh, image, there's like HH objects that are getting blown out of that star that's on top of the ridge. Yeah, on oh, the very top, little green things, you can hardly see them. But um, it's, yeah, again, it's just, it's incredible how much detail is in these images. And yeah, we are just getting started, right? This is literally the first look. Uh, in the coming weeks and months, scientists will have time to dig into these data and learn more about the detailed physics of what's going on in these types of regions. Um, yeah, and I think your second question was about how did we feel? Or how does it make you, feel? Does it make you yeah. Um, I mean, I'm just, yeah, I think, we, I think all of us are in some sense, I mean, we're just blown away. I am blown away by what I'm seeing here. Um, and my, my own research, again, re relates a little closer to the the intermediate redshift galaxies, but just being able to see the, the detailed structure that we've never seen before. Um, and of course, when you're, you know, the reason we're able to see these very distant galaxies is of course due to the infrared. Um, but we're also able to see details in galaxies much further away for that same reason, because the UV light that these stars in very distant galaxies are emitting also gets shifted, you know, to the, to the infrared part of the spectrum. And so, um, 
yeah, it's, it's, it's incredible to be here. And a lot of us here have worked, worked on this, I think maybe all of us, for over a decade at least. Um, and so it's, it's, great. it's great to be to this day finally. If I may, you know, I, we're, we're scientists and these, day, these images are used to do science. But when I saw that one in particular, I felt I was going to a, a gallery. This is a, 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 an art piece, this thing, that was revealed by, by the telescope. And there's many of them yet to be unveiled. So I, I, I think there's a good bridge here to make between science and, and arts. This is a beautiful image. So it goes beyond my scientific mind here. And Klaus, did you want to jump in as well? So I think the, the Carina Nebula is sort of emblematic of, of some of the differences uh, that we'll see with Webb compared to what expectations were in particular in terms of nebula. Right, so those of you who have been following Webb may have seen the pillars of creation. You see the beautiful Webb image, and then you see the, the very near infrared image of, uh, taken with Hubble, where you see through the dust, and the pillars, the cloud itself, they become these kind of wispy things that go away. This is not what we will see with Webb. So the Carina Nebula here, that, that image was really designed uh, with something else in mind. All the structure, you see all the yellow structure, comes from hydrocarbons. And you'll see this a lot with Webb. So these are, these are large, very large, Molecules, a lot of people argue they're not really molecules, they're too large, very small dust grains that consist of, 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 of carbon and hydrogen put together in very complicated structures. And the universe is just full of them everywhere. And we see them to the edge of the universe. Um, what happens here is that they get, uh, they light up when you shine on them with ultraviolet light. And the, the, the part of the cloud that lights up is a very thin sheet on top of the cloud. If the cloud is filled with them, but it makes you see just the surface. And that's what gives you the three-dimensional structure here. It's this thin surface, almost like a blanket that sort of waves across uh, the field. Um, and so it was, it was designed to, to show that, but also to highlight how Webb will allow us to understand these hydrocarbons. And you're asking, why are the hydrocarbons important? Well, this may be uh, the way that the universe is transporting carbon, the carbon that we're made of, uh, to planets uh, that may be habitable for life. Uh, because these very stable molecules are very difficult to destroy. They're hardy, and so they make it all the way to, uh, to planets in the habitable zones. Go ahead, Eric. Uh, so a lot of people sometimes see pictures of space, and they think uh, it makes them feel small. When I see these pictures, they make me feel powerful, that a team of people can make this unbelievable instrument to find out things about the universe revealed here. And just seeing that you know, pride in the team, but just sort of pride in humanity, that when we want to, we can do that. And it, that was always out there, right? The universe was, was out, you know, it's been out there. Mm -hmm. We just had to build a telescope to go see what was there. Yeah, very similar feeling of, 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 of maybe people in a broken world managing to do something right and to see some of the majesty that's out there. Great, thank you all. Um, we now can go and take a couple questions from the phone again to ensure that those who are dialed in also have the chance to, to ask their questions. So I'd ask the operator to please, um, again, prompt for, for questions on the phone and, and take a couple more from the phone lines. As a reminder, if you'd like to ask a question, please press star one. Again, that is star one. Our next question comes from Matt Kaplan with Planetary Radio. Your line is now open. Thank you, everyone. Uh, magnificent images, magnificent day. Uh, with the WASP 96B spectra in hand, what are you now expecting or at least hoping for in spectra from more Earth-like worlds? I mean, how close might we come to detection of those atmospheric components that could indicate life, biological activity? the question. Uh, maybe Nicole, Renee, if you'd like to start. Uh, sure. Yeah, I can start. Uh, so what you've seen with the WASP-96 were prominent water vapor absorption features. So those bumps upward are actually indicate there's water in the atmosphere absorbing starlight. And so it's very similar as we push towards smaller planets. Um, we mentioned the TRAPPIST-1 planets in particular. These are the um, best targets right now that are uh, small, rocky, earth size with a few of those planets in that system in the habitable zone of their star. Um, we're also going to be looking for evidence of water and 
as well as other molecules that contain carbon and hydrogen. So that's uh, methane, carbon dioxide, molecules like that. When you combine all that together, you can understand the content of the carbon, oxygen, hydrogen. And that's important because those are some of the basic building, building blocks of life. So uh, we're you know, hopeful that we'll see those, those data um, come out and reveal the, the spectra of those atmospheres. And I think we'll just have to wait <laughs> for time to reveal the, the story. And then Renee, if you want to, would like to add. Yeah, I just want to add that uh, we're, of course, we're looking at the, the, the system that we know now, uh, but the, you can expect many more exoplanet systems to be unveiled. And uh, you know, the test missions is already finding a lot. One thing that uh, it is predicted to exist, these uh, water worlds, you know, planets that have a rocky core with the thick oceans around them, and uh, the only way to, you know, unveil the system is to detect the water features in their atmosphere. And you can expect Webb to be able to do this once we have a target that, you know, it looks, you know, the, the, it looks like a, a, a water world. So, um, yeah, there's many, many new discoveries that we can expect. Uh, but, you know, focus on, on relatively small planets. And the majority of, of them will be around and dwarf these very small stars because it's just much easier to detect the atmosphere around these, uh, these uh, small stars. Thank you both. Uh, we can take another question from the phone lines as well. Our next question comes from King Kramer with Space Up Close. Your line is now open. Oh, wow. Thank you. Well, congratulations uh, on all your hard work and, and the great success here. Um, I'm really interested in the exoplanets, but let me ask you about uh, uh, WASP. I wonder if you detected, you talked about the water vapor, but have you detected any, anything else, any oxygen, any ammonia, any hydrocarbons? Are you still working on that? What, what do you hope more to see out of that? Thank you. So, so this was definitely, you know, the first look, right? Um, these data have hardly been analyzed. So this is kind of what comes out of the box. And so even, so there's a best fit model that's shown on the, the first spectrum here, um, but you know, you could see without the model by eye, right, the, the features that are due to water. Uh, the model is, we call it a best fit model, but it's barely scratching the surface of what we're going to learn. Um, we are expecting to learn really a precise water abundance constraints. So not just detecting that there's water in the atmosphere, but how much water is there and the implications for the overall composition. And along with improving the models, because these images, again, were just early release, you know, not detailed, um, studied in depth yet by scientists, that when you add more to the model, you can understand and pull out, as you're asking, you know, whether there's ammonia or other features, um, methane, carbon dioxide, or, or two of the other ones that we would expect in this wavelength range as well. Uh, so I think we'll just have to wait for scientists to get at the data and, and go, you know, work it with their models to, to learn more. Cole is right, right? So this, this is the first shot at, at actually getting an exoplanet spectrum with Webb. Uh, so one thing is the model, right? But when you're looking at the kind of precision we have here, 100 parts per million, uh, you're into a regime where you're, you're depending on, on you know, details of how the instrument works, how the detector works. And so I think there will be, even of this spectrum, uh, once the experts uh, get a chance to look at the raw data, they'll be able to take it, take out some of those systematics that are in there and produce an even even better spectrum, even with the data we have here, in addition to, to more data we'll get. Um, so in that sense, this is also only only the beginning. Yeah, so if I may add, so the, 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 the what, what is game changer here is the ability to probe several molecules. Hubble was mostly focused on, on water because of, this, of, this, of its narrow view, as Nicole mentioned here. Potentially one could detect methane in, in, in the spectrum, also CO. The fact that we don't see it very loudly means that you know, it's, it's not there. But as Nicole mentioned, uh, you know, this is not just a demonstration. This is scientifically useful data that people in two days will just jump on it to analyze. And then people will want to get other observations with NIRSPEC and MIRI to get the, the broader picture about the, uh, the uh, chemical composition of this, of, of this atmosphere. Great, thank you. Um, let's we can come back to the room for some questions as well. I know there are a few more up here. Go ahead. Hi, 
Hi, um, I'm Rebecca Sohn from Space.com. Um, I had two questions. Um, my first is for anyone who wants to answer. Um, I know you keep saying that, you know, in the coming days and weeks and in the next year, you know, people will analyze these first images and others um, and sort of find out more. Do you have a favorite sort of expectation that you're hoping to find out more about just these first images? Um, and my other question is specifically for Eric. Um, now that sort of the first images have been released with this telescope, um, I know that a lot of people are sort of not satisfied with the name James Webb because of his association with um, discrimination against LGBT people. I wanted to ask if the sort of name is sort of a done deal. Um, because the, the latest there is that um, if you've been following, our, our historians have gone back to um, conduct some additional research in archives that were recently uh, reopened after they'd been previously closed due to COVID-19. Um, so they are compiling that research uh, into an update that we'll be looking to share soon. Um, but I'm happy to follow up with you on that statement um, after the fact. Uh, and I think your other question was about uh, excitement for the coming year in, in terms of what uh, targets might be coming up. I don't know if yeah. there's anyone who wants to Specifically with these that. first images, like what are you hoping to find out with sort of further analysis? Who wants to jump in? Go ahead, Chris. Okay. So they didn't have time to necessarily show it earlier. In, in Stefan's quintet, there was a lot of excitement immediately after the broadcast of the spectroscopy in there as well. There's so we've got an integral field unit in both NIRSPEC and the MIRI instruments where you can slice up the spectra and scan through in wavelength. And they managed to get observations of the AGN there right in that northern galaxy um, where you can see just the gas kind of coming off of that supermassive black hole at high velocity. You can see that dynamics in the different lines going through. So we can learn about the excitement of that gas, the chemical properties of that gas. So you can see here in the emission lines on the graphic. Um, and then you can see the sight line as well into the region kind of around the central supermassive black hole for the first time. And so we think the mass of this black hole here, it's a few times more massive than the mass at the, the black hole at the center of the Milky Way. Um, and then there was another plot where you can start to see the velocities of that gas. Um, so on this one, so at the bottom there, plus or minus 200 doesn't sound a lot if you see kilometers, but that's per second. So if you think of that in miles per hour, these are tremendously powerful jets coming out of this AGN. Um, this is kind of to the moon and back in an hour. And we can learn about um, the processes in this gas and what's happening around the black hole for the first time by the power of this spectroscopy. And that's just, I think, going to be a, a real huge, exciting leap forward. Uh, is it so, true, Chris, that, that the power of those, those outflows from the AGN, they have enough power to disrupt the whole galaxy, right, to change the rate it forms stars and so on? So, yeah, we get this process called feedback where that then, in the same way as we're looking in Carina, where you've got that ionization coming and triggering star formation or influencing star formation, we can then look at the feedback of this huge, powerful, out, powerful outflow um, from this galaxy and the impact that has on the environs there as well. And then you can also see the molecular gas further in around the central black hole. Yeah, if I may, this data set is, is so rich. Uh, as I said, it was observed by all four science instruments. And uh, I, I, the, the nearest instrument actually got a, a shot of taking spectra of everything. And what we see there uh, is uh, we, there's a, you know, a background galaxy that is you know, uh, uh, with lots of distortion. And in fact, this is the same galaxy appearing at twice in, in, in the image. But when you look at the image, you don't really know that it is that the case. But by taking a spectrum of it, Actually, we, we, we have proved that you know, this is the one, this is a, another one. It, it shows that the, these two arcs are exactly the same galaxies. And that was worth three quarters of an hour worth of observation. So uh, it's just amazing. You know, it's, as uh, uh, Jane said this morning, you, you take that data before breakfast. And we're going to get much more of that in the coming uh, uh, years. You know, again, all these f uh, images were, uh, represent 120 hours. Well, there's six, seven thousands worth of time in, in a year, year after year. Uh, so it's an incredible amount of data that will come down. And I think, it, I think it's also important to, to note that just like with Hubble, these data, a lot, a lot of programs do have proprietary time, you know, a 12-month proprietary time for the PI. Um, but then after that, it's all public in the archive. Um, and a lot of the data actually in the first six months of this mission will be public immediately, including these early release science programs, some of which has, have already been taken that you've heard. Um, and so this is, again, this is data. This is a telescope for the world. 
for scientists everywhere to be able to start to dig in very soon and do real science with this data. Great, thank you all. Uh, we can take another question from the room. So we have some over here. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Joel Lockenbach with the Washington Post. Um, to follow up something Marina asked earlier uh, or, uh, to explain um, the Carina Nebula, can we look at the, at the um, Southern Ring Nebula and can someone explain a little more about what is going on there? What is the story of that dying star? Why is it dying? Is it, are we sad about the star dying? <laughs> it, it, apparently there are two stars, not one star. Um, it looks like a, a, a nice swimming hole in space. It's a beautiful image, but uh, we need the story maybe a little bit more if, if someone could do that. Thank you. Yeah, so what you have here is a star that's dying. It's not just any star. It's, it's, this is a star that is much like the sun, or at least like the sun will be in five billion years when the sun dies. So what happens here is that when stars like the sun die like this by uh, pushing out their outer layers is that they, they essentially seed the galaxy with, with uh, elements like carbon and oxygen, and that's where a lot of the carbon oxygen comes from, like we're made of. Uh, so it's a, there's, a, there's a life cycle of stars. Right, so uh, this is uh, the end for this star, but it's the beginning for other stars and for other planetary systems. So the carbon and oxygen and other elements that this puts out will eventually end up uh, creating planets uh, somewhere else in the, in the future. So I think that's really the basic story here. And what, what Webb allows us to do is to, is to understand that in much, much greater detail. What, what you'll see when you zoom in on this picture, for example, is, is the turbulence of, this, of the flow. There's so, much, so many clumps and structure in that, and that tells you something about how the star manages to push out uh, this, its outer layers, you know, how that physics works so we can understand how many of the elements actually come from this type of object. Uh, we can also measure you know, how much of the elements and in this case, he had probably created some of these hydrocarbons I talked about earlier that you see in the Carina Nebula, hardy carbon-bearing molecules that again ends up in, in planetary systems. So by understanding the formation, again, we understand, we'll understand why there are so many in the universe, uh, you know, seeing to the edge of the universe. Um, so, so it's really understanding where we come from that, that is in this story. Thank you. I think we had some other questions over here as well. Hi, Brandon Lewis with the NASA Social. Um, I think a common question many people would wonder is, is this actually how it looks? And uh, with, broad, uh, with a broader spectrum of light being captured than Hubble, how do you go about deciding which color channel to assign in the RGB color spectrum? And um, how would that like look compared to how we actually see it? Thanks for the question. Um, who would like to jump in on that one, Klaus again? <laughs> Right, so, so the, the color images here are, are created using infrared colors. And I just want to emphasize that infrared colors are just as real as, as visible colors. In fact, there are more infrared colors than there are visible colors. Just because our eyes can't see them doesn't make them colors. Um, and so if you look at the electromagnetic spectrum, the visible light, we can see it's just this tiny sliver of the whole electromagnetic spectrum. So what we do with web is not making, uh, making up colors. Uh, or, or doing something odd with them. Like for example, we also we use what's called chromatic order. So uh, we assign to the blue color um, uh, an infrared color that is bluer, that means has shorter wavelength, than a red color. And so we always maintain that order. Blue, or blue, uh, blue color means shorter wavelength, red color means longer wavelength in these images. And so you can think of it much more as a, say a translation of a language you don't understand. Right? So you, you, you take the, the, the light, in these colors, you translate it into the visible spectrum. So that if you had infrared eyes that were, that were sensitive to this light, this may be what you would see. Um, and there's no difference in the reality of this compared to the reality of the visible images you see with Hubble. Okay, thank fact, you. If you had six and a half meter diameter eyes in the infrared, <laughs> this is what you would see. <laughs> All right, great. It looks like we have another question from here in the room. Hello, yes, my name is Kevin, Kevin McLeod, and I'm from NASA Social. I'm also the curator of Deaf Eyes to the Sky. I have a question from my group. Just what's something, what was your priority 
in the observations from this week, in this coming week? What are your priorities in the observations? Thank you. I was going to say, for EROs, or feel free to jump in, Eric. Yeah, well, I, so uh, as we talked about earlier today, they are executing normal science. And so those are priority order assigned by uh, where the telescope was in the sky, what was visible, which instruments were ready uh, at the time the observation uh, came up. So those are going on right now. Uh, ERO priority was picked essentially on beauty and how informative and how interesting the science story was for each of those. And if uh, Klaus can give you more detail on how uh, they were individually picked, if you want to. Um, yeah, yeah. So um, ERO, the, the, the targets here were really picked for the, as Eric said, for the, for the, for the potential for making beautiful images, not just beautiful images, but also beautiful images that highlight something different about web. Right? So that's why we pick a, you pick a star-forming region. Obviously, the star-forming region is beautiful, but uh, we, we knew that we'd also be able to see new stars poke through all that dust because we used the infrared light. Um, for, the, for the exoplanet, uh, uh, it was picked because we knew it would have strong features so that we had a high chance of detecting, say, water in this case here, and, and show this in a beautiful way. Uh, and so that sort of went through all of that. And then, of course, uh, the, the, the targets had to be visible at the time that they were observed. And so that made the final uh, down select. Uh, let me just add, for the, for the science programs uh, that we're going to do in the next year, uh, there's really no priority in them. They're prioritized based on, on uh, the schedule. You know, so, so we don't waste telescope time by, say, by going from you know, one part of the sky to a completely different part of the sky. Um, because it, it takes a lot of time to move the telescope. So they're, they're, they're scheduled according to schedule efficiency. With the one exception is that there is a program called the Early Release Science Program, which is uh, uh, about 500 hours um, that was selected a couple of years ago. This is very different than the Early Release Observations. This is, this is a peer-reviewed, ERS peer-reviewed program made by the community. Uh, but the point of that is to make sure that there's even more data available uh, from, you know, from all the instruments and all the modes uh, spanning a wide range of science that is public immediately, has no exclusive access, period. And so they get priority because we want the community to have as much data available, in particular by the time they get to propose again. Right? So think about this. We're going to have another call for observing proposals from astronomers uh, at the end or, or of this year, early next year. And I'm very curious about, after people have seen this data, what we're going to get in terms of proposals. And so we don't want to ha anybody to have special abilities to write proposals because they have, have had access to data that others haven't had. So we want to make sure that everybody in the community have, have, has had access to data so they can base their new proposals on that data. Great, thank you. Um, let's go back to the phone lines now, as we do have a couple of questions waiting there as well. So I'd ask the operator to jump back in. As a reminder, if you'd like to ask a question, please press star one. Our next question comes from Liz Crivy with Mercury Magazine. Your line is now open. Great, thank you. Um, thank you for all for taking time to answer our questions today. Um, so someone earlier, and I apologize, but I don't recall who it was, said that cycle one proposals and observations, it turned out, aren't bold enough. So my question is, what would you like to see? How can you push JWST's capabilities further or as far as they can go? <laughs> so so I, uh, I accuse the community of being timid <laughs> on uh, cycle one. Uh, and uh, I don't mean that they weren't thinking uh, to uh, use a new capability that they had with, uh, that Webb was going to bring online. But of course, they couldn't know just how good Webb was going to be when they wrote those proposals. So there's probably some conservatism built into the number of targets they wanted or how long they think they might have to expose. And so they won't get as many targets because it's going to take longer. And now what they'll see and when they can have access to these data is that they can uh, expose shorter in some cases. They can have more targets or they can go deeper than they thought. So uh, 
I think round two, as was alluded to there by Klaus, people will be much more adventurous because they now know just how good the facility is. Okay, thank you. Um, we can go back and take another question from the phone here. Our next question comes from Dana McKenzie with Knowable Magazine. Your line is now open. Hello, thank you. I want to ask again about the Southern Ring Nebula uh, images. So I guess um, I'd be interested in if you could contrast what you can see in these images compared to what you could see from Hubble. Uh, are there things that, that you can now spot that you couldn't before? Um, and in particular in the, uh, the news release, it talked about seeing uh, separate shells uh, around the nebula. And I was wondering if you could see these before or not, and how many shells are there, and what does that tell us about the history of this particular nebula? I can uh, <clears throat> All right, so, so there were a couple of questions there. First of all, what do we see that, that Hubble doesn't see? I think there's a key thing we'll see, we see with, with Webb, and, and this, this goes beyond the southern ring as well, is that Webb sees molecules, it sees chemistry. Like Hubble uh, mostly sees atomic gas. It's so you, what you're looking at is, is different energies, different um, temperatures. So, so Hubble sees the very hot stuff, Webb sees the colder stuff, and this is where you transform the, the gas from this hot atomic gas to one that, that creates molecules. And I, as I alluded to earlier, the molecules become important because uh, this helps material uh, transition through the interstellar medium to, uh, to new stars and new planets. Um, and so you see all the red stuff there in the, in the web image, it's molecules that you just didn't see with, with, with Hubble. Uh, yeah, you do see a number of those shells here. I've actually, I mean, I've just counted them by eye. I mean, anybody can, can do that as far as I got with it, right? There's probably a handful uh, of those. And, and those come from, as the star was dying, the, in, in its last dying throes, it starts to shake, it pulsates, right? And then, and then at the end of that, poof, it comes out. So you, you, see, you see what the star did just before it created this, uh, this planetary nebula. I find that fascinating because it's, it's like geological layers, and you can see the history of its, its last moments. Yeah, if, if I may add, you mentioned the colors and the molecules that Hubble cannot see, but more fundamentally, it's the sharpness of the images. You know, this is the, the, the bigger your telescope is, the sharper your images are. And here, this is three times Hubble, so we can see much more details of everything we observe with, with, with Webb, and that's a big difference. And Chris, if you'd like to jump in too. Just very quickly, if you just do this comparison, you can see the longer wavelengths with MIRI, that hidden star just pops straight out. You've got those dust-obscured white dwarf in there. We can really then look at kind of how the binaries influenced the different structures that Klaus was just talking about. And it's by having that long wavelength for the first time with this fidelity and sensitivity that you just pop straight out and then we can kind of try and reconstruct the history of it and the, um, the different layers. So. Yeah, and it's, it's a wavelength reach of that, right? Because it, yet again, it's, we can see so many infrared colors and that allows us to see so much more physics and chemistry at the same time with the same telescope. Great, thank you. Um, then let's go back to the phone for one more question before we come to the room again. Next question comes from Matteo Rini with Physics Magazine. Your line is not open. Hi, congratulations to everybody. Uh, seeing the richness uh, of the, and the details of these images, I can only imagine what, what is going to come over the next uh, years or so. Uh, I was going to ask about the plan to analyze this massive amount of data, um, making data public, sort of artificial intelligence kind of analysis and, and things like that. How are you going to handle this, this data? Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right. So. Let's see. So we're going to uh, release the actual the raw data for astronomers uh, and planetary scientists from, from what we saw today, tomorrow. That'll open in the archive. And then the next day, today is Tuesday, yes, Thursday, um, all the commissioning data gets opened up. So that's something like 40 terabytes of data. So everything we've been seeing, that's multiple processings, but um, everything we've been uh, squinting at, gazing at, wrestling with, trying to make, you know, all of that uh, in commissioning will go public on Thursday. Um, so that's going to be fun. And in fact, I think there's, they're going to do an Amazon, um, the Institute's doing some stuff to handle the load by putting it on, on uh, the cloud. 
um, figuring everyone's going to grab it. So all of that goes out this week, um, and you know, the, it's open for the community. Um, also for the for the scientists, we put out a uh, um, a document summarizing the science performance, a very technical document um, that uh, that is available on the institute's website as well. So. Um, that's out today as of 1 o'clock, yes. Um, so that's out as well. As far as you know, AI, people are going to use lots of different approaches on these data. And you know, I just want to make it clear that this is just the very beginning. This isn't, you know, where we've, this isn't the kind of press conference where we have a polished result that's taken years of effort and we're, you know, the effort is the telescope. The telescope works. And this, these data demonstrate that the telescope works. But the science results are going to be rolling out from here on in. People are going to use lots of different techniques to, uh, to get as much science as they can out of the data. You're saying Amazon Prime Day is really the 14th. <laughs> it's going to be fun to see what the server load is. Yes, I think. Uh, of course, it, it's not us. We, it's not us who is going to do all the analysis of this data right there. Mm -hmm. There are there are literally thousands of astronomers out there. And we know this because these are the people who are represented even in the first cycle of of, uh, of proposals. And and since those proposals were submitted, I'm sure that's that's lots of new students, lots of new postdocs who are who are just gearing up to get get going on this. So it's thousands of scientists around the world who's going to grab this data and and analyze it. And I can't wait to see what they come up with. And again, and just to emphasize, I think this is such a critical aspect of these big NASA missions is the fact that the data isn't kept you know, to, to one or two people or a small team, that it is put out there. I mean, I did most of my dissertation research on archival Hubble data, <laughs> uh, you know, and it really does fuel the continual innovation that we're able to do in astrophysics because these data are out there on the archive. And so starting tomorrow, you know, again, it's not, I mean, we're ready, right? Astronomers are ready for this data. We've been waiting a long time. And so I think you know, now we've demonstrated that this telescope can do what we set out to do, and even better in some cases. And there is a whole world full of astronomers that are eagerly waiting to, to jump on this data as soon as it's public. I just want to add that the, the data processing part is a huge aspect of, of the project. There are 17 observing modes with Webb, and each require very special treatment. And it's been a lot of effort, years of effort, at the Institute in, within the instrument team to design the best possible data pipeline so that the community can actually use them as soon as they can. And so, as we sh show today, it works. And of course, there will be improvement, but that is a very fundamental aspect of the project that, yes, we have a, a, bu a beautiful telescope, instrument that works, but also data pipelines that works. Thank you all. Um, I know we have a few more questions in the room here. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Marcia Smith with SpacePolicyOnline.com. And I think my question is probably to Eric, but I'd be interested in anybody's answer, and it's one of these philosophical questions, again, about where all this fits in our understanding of the universe. And so you see all these galaxies that you didn't know were there. There are exoplanets everywhere. I don't sense that there are many solar systems like ours, you know, with a couple rocky planets and then some gas giants. I mean, they're all different kinds of solar systems. They don't seem to be very much like ours. And I'm just wondering, you know, on a fundamental level, you talked about the scientists being more bold, bolder. Do they need to be bold enough to really ask fundamental questions about whether or not everything we think we know is wrong? Is, are we on the verge of a Copernican revolution, or we suddenly realize through the eyes of JWST and all the other space telescopes and ground-based telescopes that you know we really were missing something in all of our modeling and all of our theories about how the universe works? So I'm happy to start with that, um, and I'll pick two specific cases: the distant universe case, the watching the universe turn the lights on, and then, and then I'll talk about exoplanets. Uh, so we have seen the surface of last scattering in the cosmic microwave background. We have seen the infant picture of the universe. And with current telescopes, we've gone back to when galaxies were sort of young children. We're missing that evolution in between. And so in those uh, hundreds of millions of years, the universe forms its structure that we know today. We have theories of how that worked, uh, but this is the facility that we can use to test that. 
This is something we know, and this is what we built web to do. So I expect it will be interesting. Will it be transformative? I'm not certain, but it, it's what we built this thing to do. Now, the general capabilities that are associated with that allow us to do many other things, most of which we probably don't know today. But in exoplanets, which we didn't build this for, we will begin to really do uh, detailed science of a, the multiplicity of worlds. You're right that our solar system looks unique now, and so with this we'll begin to say just how unique is the, the place that we live? Are there other places like it? I think that'll be the first transformational discovery that comes out of Webb, the habitability question that it'll be used to ask. Go ahead, Chris. Can we get the image of the, the deep field with the, the near cam and moving image? I think just as an excuse to show this, so this was um, <laughs> kind of one of the European contributions was towards the MIRI instrument, but just on the left here you have um, the deep field with including the MIRI wavelengths and just the colors here and the, um, the different galaxies. I think this is an area where kind of everyone's just looked at this and gone, what are we looking at, right? Like <laughs> and the whole community is just going to get stuck into this immediately and there's just going to be a huge leap in what we can do again by having this huge wavelength coverage for the first time. And just even just by looking at these, kind of comparing them immediately, you can start to pick things out that people will already be, I'm sure, writing proposals for ground-based telescopes to try and follow things up. And it's just going to catalyze a whole chain of lots of papers in the coming weeks. Mentioned a couple of times, but we don't know what we don't know yet. And you know, I think it's true that every time we launch a revolutionary instrument into space, like Hubble, uh, we learn things that completely surprise us, that do cause us to sort of change our fundamental understanding of how the universe works. And of course, dark energy is like our generation's example of that. Um, who called for that, right? Nobody expected that. Um, and we still, right, we still don't know what it is. You know, there's still so much work to do for that. Um, but I think the point is, is that we, it was totally unexpected. And so it's, it's hard to, to imagine what we might learn with this 100 times more powerful instrument uh, that we really don't know yet. Um, so I think that's definitely possible. So maybe add, add something to the uh, planets and the habitability and the questions of that. So one of the big questions I have, right, and this goes to Webb being able to better understand the zoo of exoplanets. When you say we're looking for habitable planets, are we looking for planets just like the Earth around a solar type star orbiting at one AU and the star is five billion years old? Or is most uh, sort of the habitable area of the universe, is that in a completely different place? Right? is that planets around much smaller stars, which may be much more common than planets around solar type stars, just because the smaller stars, M dwarfs, are much more common, or is most, most life in, in moon systems around giant planets, right? So if we have in our own solar system, we have ocean worlds. Is that where most, you know, most areas of habitability exist in the universe? We just don't know the answer to that, and I think Webb, in this exoplanet research, we'll be able to, to make leaps in that direction. We get a much better understanding of where we actually ought to look, whether it should look like the Earth or look like something else. Uh, another other questions in the room? Anyone who? Oh, here we go. Do we have any? I think we've already asked. We have a couple over here. Oh, and what from some who maybe haven't asked one as well over here. Hi, my name is Abdul Dramali. I'm with NASA Social. I'm an astrophotographer. That's way better than my work, I admit. <laughs> um, my question, uh, we briefly touched on dark energy in the previous question, but uh, my question is more specific to dark matter. And given that we have no instruments that can directly interact with or measure dark matter, can we expect to learn anything new about the makeup of galaxies and other celestial objects in relation to dark matter from Webb? Field. Actually, no, this, keep this one. This is good. All right. So. Um, the reason that those arcs are there, the reason that those twisty, you know, those long stretched out distorted taffy galaxies look like that is dark matter, right? It's the, it's, the gravita it's the gravity of the cluster that's doing all the distortion and almost all of that is due to dark matter, right? So of the, the mass energy budget of the universe, we understand 4%, right? The stuff that's the periodic table, the stuff like us. And the rest is dark energy, which we don't understand, and dark matter, which we don't understand. Um, so, you know, when you look at an image like this, you're right, we can't directly detect dark matter, right? It, it's, oh, it's confounding. But 
we see its impact, right? The, it's the dark matter that is doing the lensing in this field, right? So there's not, near, there's, there's not enough mass from the stuff we're made of in there to do it. There's not enough stars. It's dark matter. So directly detecting it is something different. You, that's, a, that's a laboratory experiment. But what we can do is see how it works and how it interacts. Um, we can see its effects in action, right? So by studying clusters like this, this is what I do for a living, so I'm getting pretty excited. Um, so we can, we can map out where the mass is in the cluster. And we can understand um, uh, the mass distribution and how it relates to galaxies, which helps us understand where the dark matter is. And that, that's an indirect way to get at what the heck is going on with dark matter. But it's the most powerful tool we have astrophysically to do that is this type of lensing experiment. And dark matter also is it's one of the you know, like big overarching questions we're hoping to answer with this telescope is really to learn more about the big picture of how galaxies change over time, right? You see the very distant galaxies in these images look totally different than the way nearby local galaxies look. And sort of putting together that picture of how galaxies change, really important. And we know that dark matter has to have a key role in that because we know all the galaxies that we see are surrounded by this dark matter. Dark matter is sort of the scaffolding of the universe that galaxies sit on. And so this process of how galaxies change over time has to be due really critically to how the dark matter works in the universe. And so even just by studying that overall process of galaxy evolution, we're gonna be able to learn more about how dark matter works. Thank you. Um, and we have time for maybe one or two more questions here, and I know there are a couple over here. Hello, I'm El Joy. I'm a guest of the NASA Social and host of Sunday Civics. Um, it was said in the uh, program earlier, and I know this from different missions, that there's a lot of science and invention that went into developing. Um, and then also from missions and NASA work in general, there are a lot of things that transfer over from space and science to the regular world. Um, and so uh, can you talk a bit about, I know there's one thing so far that has transferred in terms of LASIK surgery or something, but you know, what other things could we expect um, um, or look at that could come to um, the regular world or to regular people from uh, NASA science and uh, missions? I can start off with one. So you mentioned the, uh, the LASIK device, and that came from uh, how we had to measure our mirror segments, the accuracy we had to measure the, the surface of those, and that turned into a commercial product. There are some uh, other products and processes that were invented within industry that changed how they did business. And so this might not be something that shows up uh, you know, in your uh, optometrist's office or on your kitchen table, but a whole industry uh, learned a new way to bond materials together, to glue uh, composite structures together. And so a lot of invention uh, we may not see directly here uh, in the room, but it changes how uh, industry works. And uh, that's one that was a big one for us uh, and, and the company that uh, in, invented that. And I know folks at Northrop Grumman also had to invent some new processes in their own manufacturing of uh, space vehicles. So uh, th that's a big part of this uh, turning NASA research into regular industry products. Great, thank you. Uh, and this is the last question that we have time for, so we can go ahead with one more up here. Can you, oh, is it on? Sorry. Okay, sorry. <laughs> uh, Catherine Troach with uh, NASA Social. Um, you said that the data will be available for astronomers, citizen scientists. Will we have an opportunity to play with some of the data? Will there be projects like the cloud spotting on Mars project that's happening on Zooniverse right now? So let me fix it. Yes, anyone can download the data if it's, um, some of the data have a, a period where they're um, up to a year period where the, the team that proposed it gets a head start and then it goes public. But anyone in the world can download the data. So I should have specified. Um, so you're asking about in particular um, programs that will involve citizen science where they'll, they'll have higher. Um, so those presumably are gonna kick off 
but we haven't had, we need data first, right? So let's get the data flowing, and then yeah, there's, there's going to be lots of opportunities, right? I mean, for one thing, look how many galaxies are in these fields. If you pull up, can we pull up Stefan's quintet? For me, what was surprising about Stefan's quintet uh, was just how many galaxies are in the background, right? Everywhere is a deep field. And, and that, that's been true since the first focus images got photobombed, right? Like it's just, they're always there. So there've gotta be some really cool, and one of the funny things about uh, galaxy classification is humans do it better, both galaxy classification and finding lens galaxies. Um, humans are better at that than machines. In fact, we use the humans to try to teach the machines how to do it, but we're better at it. So there's got to be some fun things for, and, and important things for humans are better at classifying galaxies, finding arcs, finding weird stuff, right? I mean, we saw that for, uh, for the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, that many of the most interesting discoveries, like the green peas, were found by amateurs who were doing citizen science, and were like, what is that? You know, why is it this little green thing? Oh, that's a galaxy that's pouring out emission lines, like the one we, like the galaxy we saw at high redshift, right? Um, so there's got to be lots of opportunities for that, just because there's so much data. Great, thank you, Jane. Um, and as mentioned, that is all the time we have today. Uh, but if you had a question that we didn't get to, uh, we encourage you to reach out to us on NASA's media team, and we'll be happy to help. Um, so thank you very much again to all of our panelists today, uh, as well as to those who joined us here and all around the world uh, to celebrate this release of the first full color images and data from Webb. Um, and as many have mentioned, this is really only the beginning for the mission. Uh, so we'd encourage you to continue to follow along. Uh, you can find news updates at nasa.gov slash web, um, as well as on social media, uh, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at NASA Web. So thank you all again. Uh, and with that, for those watching online, let's take one more look at Webb's first full color images. Thanks. <laughs>